Well, today is a special day for us because it's Greg's dream is coming true. We're going to talk about Bigfoot. <laughs> so Greg's found some good videos on a guy who claims to have seen Bigfoot. Greg, why don't you tell us what you've seen or what, you're, what videos yep. we're going to watch? So I asked people, what's a great video for Bigfoot? And they said, there's a guy named Mike Willie who is in Louisiana who saw a Bigfoot and he's believable. So I went and found that video and then we found some other supporting videos. So we got some really good stuff here for you. I think the first video is going to be something he did for the Travel Channel, his last interview. Unfortunately, Mr. Willie passed away in 2019. Otherwise, we'd be trying to talk to him. Um, and then the second is from a movie called Skookum, which is Hunt for Bigfoot. And then the third set of videos will come out of a 2019 interview with B the Bigfoot Explorer team going and talking to Mr. Woolley among his last interviews. My name is Mike Woolley. I'm from Keechaw, Louisiana. I had an encounter back in December of 1981 with a Bigfoot while deer hunting. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, December day. Perfect weather for a hunt. Temperature was about 30 degrees. I got to my deer stand that evening, about three o'clock, got on it. And uh, I was sitting there and I was facing uh, to the north. And uh, my deer stand was located about a mile and a half down Old Logging Road and off the main highway, secondary highway. And what I would do, I would park my truck halfway down the logging road and I would walk in the rest of the way because I didn't want to drive my truck down and spook the deer. Well, it must have been, uh, I hadn't been there no more than 30 minutes and uh, this little young doe deer come running from the east out of some briars and brush that there's no way a human could walk through that. But she come up to my deer stand and what was so amusing, come up to my deer stand and laid down up and actually touching the deer stand. She was wringing wet with sweat. She had been run, something had been running her. And I first thing hit my mind, it was a big buck. And I said, I'm gonna kill me a big buck. Rick, what do you got? So I'm gonna tell you that every war story a person tells over and over and over, they will deconflict that war story to the point that every time they tell it, they're gonna know what other people want to hear and they're gonna tell it. So. No, no surprise there. If you ask me about a war story, something happened to me in, in the first Gulf War, I can tell you all the details and I'm probably going to chase to do the same. We're going to think about the mechanics of what we should tell you to make sure you understand how things were and give you pertinent information. People do that all the time. They deconflict. And if you tell a story for 38 years, you're going to do that. So no surprise there. There's one factual inaccuracy in here that just didn't happen for sure. Deer don't sweat. So it didn't come up running, ringing wet. They foam at the mouth. They pant like a dog. So that's not a fact, but I've heard him in other places say the, the thing was panting and foaming at the mouth. Looks good. Everything's smooth. He's illustrating. He's saying what he thinks. His sentence structure is pretty consistent. The and does are just part of his normal delivery. Um, I, I've watched not just war stories, but if you've been around hunters much, this level of detail and the way he's telling the story, I've heard that a million times the deer came up and it laid like I care what happened before you pull the trigger and kill the deer. But to them, it's a big part of their hobby, big part of their day. So it sounds like a normal Southern guy telling a story about hunting. Uh, Scott, what do you got? All right. He's given quite a lot of detail, which is fine. And like you said, Greg, deers don't sweat. So right out, right from the beginning, that's a little bit of that. That doesn't, that doesn't sit right with me. And then the reason you've, feel that you understand everything really clearly is because of the picture he creates in your mind. I train people how to do that. And so what we're seeing is a great technique it's, and it's the old bull <laughs> technique. That's where he repeats things. President Trump does that as well. He repeats things. He'll say things two or three times. You know, he, this guy talks like he's wearing a wire. He keeps talking about a deer stand, deer stand, deer stand. Every other word is deer stand, it feels like. Then he talks about the, the, the old road. He talks about the road again. He repeats several things. So his 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 patterns are to create a picture. And so he's I'm sure he's a great storyteller as well. And um, we don't see a lot of movement with him. Not a whole lot of movement. Um, not not very many illustrators. His head moves a little bit. That's about it. And he's again, he's creating really clear picture with words and it's it works. I think it, it sounds believable right then. Chase, what do you got? 
Let's let's break it down. Blink rate, which we typically associate if someone's blinking more often or, you know, their eyes are blinking more often. We associate that with stress. It stays consistent throughout this video. There's narration with the head to the right, this tilting when he's narrating where something is and it's right on cue. His eyes move consistently to the same direction as as he's recalling the entire story. There's a single shrug in here. And this, when somebody does this, this sometimes indicates they lack confidence in what they're saying. In this instance, it makes sense with the behavior because he's discussing the amount of time that he's spent there before this incident happens. I would say this is generally a uh, mostly believable story. That's all I got, Mark. Yeah, I got to say the same, and and it's great because this starts so well it's 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 clear it's consistent it's assertive it's direct there's there are i would say no deviations from from you know what you'd expect or what's set up so it, it's pleasant to to see because normally straight off the bat we're like oh there's something going on here but right now it's it seems very very uh true um it came to mind i'm, I'm not sure whether Prince Andrew should have suggested he was a deer. I obviously thought hasn't thought of that particular alibi. It's it's worth worth thinking of. I give you that one for free. The next one will cost you, uh, sir. So, um, but to your point, Scott, and, and and I think you're right here. There was a there was a German uh, propagandist who said, "Repeat the lie enough, and people will <laughs> will believe it." Um, and that's the same for us, you know, when we tell stories again and again and again and again, and they adapt over time, uh, they suddenly become even more believable for us as well. So, I, so, you know, part of me doesn't want that to be true. And, and part of me says, you know, if you're right, Greg, this is a story he's told time and time again, there's an option that it has adapted over time and it may not be so accurate. But having said that, right off the bat, looks very, very good for me. I'm excited. My name is Mike Woolley. I'm from Keechaw, Louisiana. I had an encounter back in December of 1981 with a Bigfoot while deer hunting. Uh, it was a beautiful uh, December day, perfect weather for a hunt. Temperature was about 30 degrees. I got to my deer stand that evening, about three o'clock, got on it. And uh, I was sitting there and I was facing uh, to the north. And uh, my deer stand was located about a mile and a half down Old Logging Road and off the main highway, secondary highway. And what I would do, I would park my truck halfway down the logging road and I would walk in the rest of the way because I didn't want to drive my truck down and spook the deer. Well, it must have been, uh, I hadn't been there no more than 30 minutes and uh, this little young doe deer come running from the east out of some briars and brush that there's no way a human could walk through that. But she come up to my deer stand and what was so amusing, come up to my deer stand and laid down, up and actually touching the deer stand. She was wringing wet with sweat. She had been run, something had been running her. And I first thing hit my mind, it was a big buck. And I said, I'm gonna kill me a big buck. So when I raised my head back up, I was turning my head and out of my peripheral vision, I seen something uh, hop to a tree. And it was tall, about seven, eight foot tall. And it was black, real hairy, like a gorilla. And I knew it wasn't a gorilla because there was no circus in town and, and I knew it hadn't escaped and I knew we didn't have no gorillas running loose. So the first thing hit my mind, it was somebody dressed up in a suit trying to scare me off my good deer hunting spot. Well, I immediately I go to talking to this thing, telling it, you know, take the head off, get out of here, you know, don't come back, you know, this ain't no joke, I don't find it funny, you know, just leave. Well, this thing was just eyeballing me, you know, looking at me and really giving me some sinister looks. And I knew right then, I said, you know, something ain't right. Well, this went on for a few minutes and uh, he must have been about 20 yards from me, 15, 20 yards. So I take my rifle, I've got a high-powered rifle with a high-powered scope on the rifle. And I look through the scope at the creature and 
I knew that after looking at it, I was in a situation because it was cold, you know, the moisture was coming out of its mouth, its nostrils. Uh, it looked really, really human. The face was, was, was human. Uh, it, uh, the eyelashes, I could see the eyelashes, you know, the eyes, uh, the teeth, the teeth were big, big teeth, flat teeth like our teeth. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and it just, it's really PO'd at me. And it lets out a roar like a lion. Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah, look, um, still the same, roughly the same cadence, calm, assertive, direct. So I'm really enjoying this because it, it still feels pretty good. My The main worry that now jumps out to me is so anyway well well there's a, a little more kind of jumps from moments of the story to other moments of the story i'm a little bit worried by that a little bit of lip licking that we weren't seeing before between that again none of those things it's not enough to say okay now it's started getting deceptive especially when there's such a good uh baseline of the same cadence that he had before again though uh, you know how many times has he told this story adapted it for himself how true does it feel for him still i'm pretty pretty still still pretty excited by it though uh chase what do you got uh so let's cover uh let's cover the deception indicators then i'll cover all the truthful indicators so right here at the beginning we start with some lip licking this is a hygienic gesture it's made to make us look more uh, believable unconsciously, and all these behaviors are likely unconscious. Then there's more lip licking at the visual description of this uh, this creature. There's word repetition of high power, scope, eyelashes, human, teeth, teeth, teeth. There's a blink rate spike, and when we say blink rate, it's how often someone's blinking, stress, right at the point of detailed recall about the face which are kind of the, maybe just the orange, dark orange flags to me here. Let's go through the true signals. There's a smooth, even tone, comfortable editing his own words mid-sentence. When people who are being deceptive are very uncomfortable going back and editing as they're talking, comfortable using a combination of simile and metaphor in the same description, calling the face human. It was like a human face. It was a human face. It had a human face. Blink rate is steady throughout except for that one point, and he's comfortable ascribing meaning to emotional expressions on the face. He doesn't say it looked PO'd, I saw the face, and it looked like he was mad. He just says he was PO'd at me. So I think the truth might just outweigh the deception here. Scott? All right. Again, he's being very repetitive. Pay attention to the, as we go through these, listen to the, the times he, re, he repeats the same words, changes the phrase a little bit, but it's the same words in there. This helps create that picture in your mind. When I'm training entrepreneurs to create a picture that they can take home and give somebody else to their person, their husband, their wife, so they can say, here's what we're investing in. Or if somebody goes back to their office and says, or back to the company and says, well, so what are we going to invest in this or what? Yeah, we are because it looks like this. They've got to be able to pop that picture out and pop it in somebody else's head and that's he's he's a, such a great storyteller because he's doing that wonderfully well because he this is the way stories get started and there's old Wooly. here's what happened to him and you can tell just you can right now from what you've heard so far you can say what's happened to him and what he saw you can talk about that deer and all how how he was sitting on a stand and you saw all those things because those create specific pictures and pictures in your mind so I think he's doing a great job here. And I think I think there is a little we can see a little bit of iffy in there, but boy, it sure sounds good at this point. All right, we good? What are you gonna say, Greg? No, I haven't gone yet. Oh, you hadn't? Oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm so I'm thinking about you the whole time because I know you're loving this. <laughs> <laughs> so I I keep thinking you've gone. Okay, what do you got? Oh, well, you know what? Like I said, when we first started this whole thing, I think most of the Bigfoot things I've seen are very easy just to take apart. So far, this is good. I mean, his story, his storytelling, it's not abnormal for a hunter. Like I said, I always said in the beginning, when we first started doing this show, I would say to you, 
pay attention to war stories and don't believe any of them because none of them are true. The basis is true, but all the details are not reliable for a couple of reasons. Every time Chase and I would sit and talk about a war story, we would have to ask, I'll ask Chase a question you might not have thought of before. He has to now go back and fill that in. Now, that doesn't mean that he's making it up. He just has to fill it in. So it's not his memory anymore because he's going to sit and say, well, it must have been this. And so he'll fill that detail in next time he's talking to somebody with a, a like background. Now, we speak a different language because we're a generation apart in the military. But if you were talking to someone in his same generation, he would fill in those details. And as Chase, you brought it up first. Every time you open a memory, you edit that memory. Every time you touch it, you're editing it. So we're not going to get 100% accurate ever. And the more times you tell a story, the more times you're going to fill in details like that. Now, but what he is really good at is he's making a picture, like you said, of exactly what he remembers, what he remembers at this point. A couple of red flags for me, but clusters are what we look for. A little bit too much eye contact. I usually say romancer when I did the true crime workshop. Too much eye contact suddenly makes me think the person's trying to hypnotize me with their eyes and their story. And so I'm a little cautious. The other one is that blink rate that goes up and it's around when he's talking about the face and the 20 minute time zone. And those two are the only two things I see that make me want to go after him and say, okay, wait a minute. He does an uncharacteristic stumble when he's talking about the teeth and who knows why, but so far looks pretty good. looks pretty believable. He punctuates with his head when he says somebody in a suit, and a good deer stand, you can tell he's told us many times. That doesn't make it untrue. Many stories we tell will still be at their core true and still adjusted over time. That's what I got. And you know what's interesting about that? About when you're saying the differences in, in the generation between you and Chase? When, when Brad and Chase were telling those stories about where they rolled a Jeep or something happened, uh, when they were telling war stories, they would add stuff to remember this happened, remember that happened. Oh, yeah, you're right. Oh, yeah, you're right. Because they're there together. Was, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And one won't remember because wherever Brad was sitting in a different place, then Chase was That's sitting. Right. So something That's right. completely different would, would happen at that. Uh, and, Which that why it's why when you when you capture prisoners, you separate them so they don't pollute each other's stories. You keep them sterile. And it, anytime we talk to people, we are careful that we listen. And if we hear the same story, we know it's concocted because they'll have different perspectives on it. The core story will be the same, but their perspectives yeah. would be very different. Oh, like it was that. a Humvee, not a Jeep. I was going to say oh, Jeeps were out of service <laughs> long before. Yeah, yeah. Jeeps, uh, Jeeps went out in my time. There we go. So. There it is. Nailed it. <laughs> so when I raised my head back up, I was turning my head and out of my peripheral vision, I seen something, uh, hop to a tree and it was tall about seven eight foot tall and it was black real hairy like a gorilla and i knew it wasn't a gorilla because there was no circus in town and and i knew it hadn't escaped and i knew we didn't have no gorillas running loose so the first thing hit my mind it was somebody dressed up in a suit trying to scare me off my good deer hunting spot well i immediately i go to talking to this thing telling it, you know, take the head off, get out of here, you know, don't come back, you know, this ain't no joke, I don't find it funny, you know, just leave. Well, this thing was just eyeballing me, you know, looking at me and really giving me some sinister looks. And I knew right then, I said, you know, something ain't right. Well, this went on for a few minutes and uh, he must have been about 20 yards from me, 15, 20 yards. So I take my rifle, I've got a high-powered rifle with a high-powered scope on the rifle, and I look through the scope at the creature, and I knew that after looking at it, I was in a situation because it was cold, you know, the moisture was coming out of its mouth, its nostrils. Uh, it looked really, really human. The face was, was, was human. Uh, it, uh, the eyelashes, I could see the eyelashes, you know, the eyes. Uh, the teeth, the teeth were big, big teeth, flat teeth like our teeth. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at it and it just, it's really PO'd at me. And it lets out a roar like a lion. Hi, your name and where you're from? My name is Mike Woolley. I'm from Keecha, Louisiana. All right, Mike, so what got you interested in Skookum? Well, I was, uh, I used to do a lot of deer hunting, and uh, I had some sightings while I was hunting, and uh, it, it really uh, kind of was uh, weird to me uh, seeing these creatures, 
and uh, it, I was more interested in them because, uh, you know, being out in the woods uh, hunting all the time and, and, and seeing a few of them, you know, I, I was kind of uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't know what they was or where they were from. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to get more information on them and try to learn more, but I was afraid to say anything because of the ridicule. Uh, I was I kept silent for over 20 years because of uh, you know what had happened to me, and uh, here recently uh, about 2000, uh, all the shows started coming on about the Sasquatches, you know, and I, I saw people that was you know getting on TV and telling their stories, and you know the same thing basically happened to me. All right, if you don't know who we are, we're the Behavior Panel. And I'm Scott Rouse, I'm a body language expert and analyst, and I train law enforcement in the military in interrogation and body language. And I created the number one online body language course, bodylanguagetactics.com, with Greg Hartley. Mark? I'm Mark Bowden. I'm an expert in human behavior and body language, help people all over the world to stand out, win trust, gain credibility every time they communicate, including some of the leaders of the G7. Chase. Hey, I'm Chase Houston. Did 20 years in the U.S. military. Read the number one best-selling book in behavior profiling, influence, and persuasion. You can just type my name into the app store to get advanced training and all that behavior stuff. Greg, I'm Greg Hartley. I'm a former Army interrogator, interrogation instructor, resistance to interrogation instructor. I've written 10 books on body language and behavior. Put together the number one body language tactics.com course with Scott Rouse, and I spend most of my time on corporate America. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so look, uh, just a couple of, of rules of thumb, and they really are rules of thumb, upward inflection and downward inflection. A downward inflection can denote certainty or command or finality to it. An upward inflection, um, more questioning, potentially a little more uncertain or a looking for approval of it or, or open to other input on it. Interesting, he says his name, Mike Woolley, and there's an upward inflection on it. It's suggests to me he might want some reassurance, not about his name, he knows who he is, but some reassurance as a person as he's being interviewed in this situation. Louisiana has a downward inflection. Uh, Louisiana, the state does not need any assurance of, of what it is, so that's more certain. Deer hunting, downward inflection, and then we get our first uncertain upward inflection on creatures, so he's not quite sure what this thing is that he that he saw. Though later on, after uncomfortable, ridicule, silent, uh, we get Sasquatch. So he is able to call it something. He's able to call it something, but um, but it, it's still a, a a a creature before. So there's some uncertainty there. Um, happened to me. Downward inflection. Look so. There's some certainty that something happened to him. He definitely isn't certain what he is, what it is, but he is prepared to call it something that other people have called it. There, that's all I got on that one. Scott, what do you got? <laughs> Say Sasquatch again. Sasquatch. Say it. Sasquatch. <laughs> okay. He goes straight into having seen a bunch of big feet, not just the one. You know, it's just this is a, a, a situation where as he goes along in these videos, you're going to have it. You're going to hear how he's added just something here and something there and something here. And over the years, this thing blows up into this big story about Bigfoot, you know, you know. So we see li very little in his head movements still not a whole lot going on there. And right here, he tells us the reason why he's telling this story and why he's into Bigfoot, because he thinks he can get on TV and talk about it like all these other people had. He's like, shit, I got a story like that. I can tell my Bigfoot story. And it might've been a situation where he was sitting there with his wife and he said, you know what I ought to do? I think I'm gonna tell these people this Bigfoot story. He said, don't do it. He's like, I'm gonna do it, you dare me? I think maybe that might've triggered him going on TV as well, the, the combination of the two. And we're going to hear him going from seeing the Bigfoot for the very first time to to all these intricate things that happen where he's almost damn Bigfoot's almost his brother in law. And they go out and have a time shared Hilton head and all these things because he gets he starts adding that many things to it. So it's, it's starting to starting to smell a little bit here. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I won't cover all that because we've got a lot to go in this show. 
But I will say this, I can see uncertainty in him. Mark, your point, when he lilts up at the end of every one of those, boom, boom, creatures, and you pay attention, his eyes are downright eye accessing. And we say that's emotional. That doesn't mean he's having an emotional moment about Bigfoot. That means he may have uncertainty and he's got to be cautious and he doesn't want to be whatever. Look, a lot of times these stories start, I'm, I'm a Southern boy. I grew up in places where there's always some thing in the woods that really doesn't exist there, like black panthers running around and the, as they call them in Georgia and those kinds of things, mountain lions, those kinds of things, they really don't exist, but they're such a big part of folklore that people just keep going on and on and they keep expanding on it. You know, there's whole families of them and that kind of thing. I think what we find is often the genesis of what somebody thinks was a Bigfoot can be simple and explained, but if it doesn't get explained, then it becomes part of that person's lore and they have to keep expanding it and keeping it alive. I tell everybody the story of the kid that was with me, a young PFC in the woods who saw Bigfoot, came and got me and took me to see the Bigfoot because I told him, there's no way in hell there's a Bigfoot out here. And it was a deer eating acorns out of a tree. Well, if I'd lived in the Bronx my whole life and I walked up and saw a deer walking around on its back legs, I might think it's a Bigfoot too. But once you cleared it up, now he's like, oh, that was stupid. If he never saw it, never figured out what it was, he might tell the Bigfoot story the rest of his life. Chase, what do you got? Yeah. So this uh, social pressure he's worried about, the technical term for this is called folkways. This is a psychological term to describe what we should do, how we should act in certain social situations. They start getting enforced in elementary school when we make fun of someone for wearing a shirt that looks, you know, out of uniform or out of character for everybody else. So these are called folkways. At the large end, like murder, we have punishment. We have social punishment for doing and breaking norms. That's what that is. I want to get one thing out of the way here. I'm biased a little bit. I kind of want Bigfoot to exist. I want to think that there's something cool out there. There's a you know another creature. So uh, I want to do my best to be unbiased in here. But I want to do want to get something out of the way. When we make an analysis here, it's based on what we see. So keep in mind, we didn't ask the questions a certain way like an interrogator would. The way that questions are asked plays a really big part in how a person responds in a behavioral sense. Somebody's first time on camera, you're going to see a, a large uh, fluctuation in that person's behavior. So like we see emotional accessing here when he's talking about how strange it was. And in this video, we're seeing a few behaviors that might look like stress. There's chest breathing. There's a sharp increase in blink rate, which is a stress marker when he's initially discussing this sighting. And if you're learning behavior skills for the first time, it's easy to spot these things. But what might be difficult is spotting them starting to happen and identifying context. In this case, the breathing is consistent the whole video. So it could be the presence of the camera. The interviewers might just look like dicks. One thing to pay attention to is that you'll hear a lot of experts describe behaviors to you in a way that makes them look like a still image in your head. This is bad. So what I'm looking for, what you should be looking for, are changes in behavior. So if you're a profile, that means you're a change detector first. So when are these behaviors starting to occur and when does the change happen? All right, so state your name and where you're from. My name is Mike Woolley. I'm from Keechaw, Louisiana. All right, Mike, so what got you interested in Skookum? Well, I was, uh, I used to do a lot of deer hunting, and uh, I had some sightings while I was hunting. And uh, it, it really uh, kind of was uh, weird to me uh, seeing these creatures. And uh, it, I was more interested in them because uh, you know, been out in the woods uh, hunting all the time and, and, and seeing a few of them, you know, uh, I, I was kind of uncomfortable. Uh, I didn't know what they was or where they were from. Um, so uh, I, I wanted to get more information on them and try to learn more. But I was afraid to say anything because of the ridicule. Uh, I, was, I kept silent for over 20 years because of uh, you know what had happened to me, and uh, here recently, uh, about 2000, uh, all the shows started coming on about the Sasquatches, you know, and I, I saw people that was you know getting on TV and telling their stories, and you know the same thing basically happened to me. 
And so, why don't you go ahead and um, tell us about the experiences that you had? Uh, the first experience, uh, the, I've had I had a visual before this one, but I wasn't sure it was a bear. But the one that 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 happened, uh, the physical experience, was back in December of 1981. I was deer hunting. Uh, I went down the main highway, turned off on a secondary road, went about two miles back in a game reserve, and took a left down Old Logging Road. The Old Logging Road went about a mile back and dead ended. That's where I put my deer stand at the dead end, and I would park my truck halfway between there, about at the half mile mark, you know, because I didn't want to spook the deer driving in there. Well, I was sitting on my stand one uh, December day, temperature was about 35 degrees, nice weather for deer hunting, and uh, I was facing north. And uh, uh, the timber to the right of me was real, real thick. You couldn't even walk through it. There were so many briars, so many tight trees. Well, I was sitting there, and I was looking north, and uh, this little young doe come running up to my deer stand. I mean, she was real, real young. Uh, usually deer run away from you, but she run up to my deer stand and actually laid down in front of my deer stand, touching the deer stand. It was a lean-to ladder up against a tree. Well, she was panting, she was just foaming at the mouth, she'd been running hard. Well, the first thing that entered my mind, uh, there's a big buck chasing her. Well, out of my peripheral vision, I saw something to the right of me about 20 yards and as I looked, it jumped behind a tree. And when I looked, it was a big, black, tall, hairy, gorilla-looking thing. You know, standing behind a tree, looking at me. And I first thought it was somebody in a suit playing jokes on me. So here I am, you know, I'm, I'm chewing this thing out. I'm telling, hey, you know, take your head off. This ain't no joke, you know. I'm sick of it, you know, you know, made me mad. Get out of here. Well, this thing is just looking at me, you know, as I talk, it's looking up and down and, and, and checking me out. And so, this goes on a total of 15 minutes, and uh, uh, I get to looking at it, and uh, the hair is just real shiny, you know. And I am get to thinking, man, somebody did a good job on that suit. And then uh, questions started popping through my head, like, is there a circus in town? Did a gorilla break out? You know, no. Uh, how could somebody come from that direction as thick and tight as it is? I couldn't even do it, you know. No. Well, all of a sudden, uh, uh, this, th this thing, I got to notice in its eyes. And uh, its eyes was real, real evil, real sinister looking, you know, the look it was giving me. And I was thinking, how can a human do that? All right, Greg, what do you got? Now he's got my attention. He starts off talking about the one that happened, the one that happened. And he almost says that really happened, almost says. He's and he stumbles over some word there. That's a push-pull word in my world. Well, what do you mean the one that happened? I thought you said this had happened many times. You'd seen creatures. So I'd start poking him right there. This is starting to come apart for me. Then he goes down this typical hunt story. And look, watch his hands. Watch when he illustrates. He illustrates when he's talking about the deer. He illustrates when he's talking about the tree stand. When we say illustrators, we mean you're using part of your body to punctuate your thoughts or words. And you can see him doing that when he's talking about the deer and the lean-to tree stand. There's no hand movement when he gets down to talking about this critter. You know, we don't get any of that. I agree with you. He's an old, he's, this is a BS technique, Scott, to anchor on certain words and bring you back to those when the time comes. And then he gets to the whole thing about his gun. Um I, he rationalizes what it should be. I think that's a good example, Scott, of what you brought up earlier. If I can rationalize what it should be and then eliminate those, then it must be Bigfoot. Yeah. Uh, you know, it could be a person in a suit. No. Could it be a gorilla that escaped? No. Could it be something else? No. Then it must be a Bigfoot. So I think we're seeing that storytelling starting to come apart. He also changes his time from 20 minutes to 15 minutes. In the other story, now that's not really pertinent to whether he actually saw this thing or not, but there are details that are different in the stories. I think it's because he's going to do a movie. He's trying to keep it concise and clear. This is going to be in front of the whole world, he's thinking. The other one for the Travel Channel, don't know what he was thinking at that point, but the story doesn't sound quite as believable as it did with those edits from the Travel Channel. Mark, what do you got? Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I'm concerned that he that he starts to want to tell another story and then discounts it and goes goes to this one. Um, I do like, however, that he starts to I mean, I like it in terms of his storytelling, in that he starts to describe unnatural behavior of of other other animals before the main player comes in and it's a brilliant storytelling technique and you'll see it in films uh you know across history before the big monster player comes in the earth or other creatures on the earth will start to behave abnormally wind will blow in weird ways uh little creatures will run in odd directions birds will go silent and you know weird stuff happens before the unnatural starts to to come in uh, so great piece of storytelling there. Uh, jumped behind a tree. There's a, there's a very strong um, uh, illustrator there, but out of frame, out of frame. And, and he's got quite a wide frame. So often we see that when somebody is willing to gesture a long way away from themselves, they might be distancing themselves from this, this situation. But, it, but verbally, he's not. He's really a direct as well. But why put it so far from him? I don't like that. Um, the gorilla reasoning. I like that there's reasoning there. I like that he gives a, a, you know, could be this. But just as you say, Greg, he then discounts rather than going, here's the reason for it being Bigfoot. And then we could discount gorilla by going yeah there's this reasoning for but he just kind of negates it i don't like that i, I do kind of like that he gives it a theory of he creates a theory of mind for the creature it's sinister and it's and it's evil and that's usually pretty good if somebody's come up with a psychology for it however in videos that come up this whole personification is going to escalate to some extraordinary uh, degrees. So hang out for that. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? Yeah, I agree that anthropomorphic uh, turn into to a human thing is starting to get on my nerves too. But now we've added the part from where the deer was sweating to where now it's foaming at the mouth. So somewhere along the line, somebody said, hey man, you, you got to you gotta straighten that out. That's it's, it's a deer foaming at the mouth, not sweating. Now he's added shiny hair and somebody in a, in a Bigfoot suit or in an animal, some kind of suit. And he says that he was hollering back and forth at it for 15 minutes. That's a long time. That's a heck of a long time to be yelling at anybody back and forth or hollering at something for 15 minutes. And they said, no, he, he, he didn't shoot it because it looked, it looked too human, but he, he didn't shoot. He, he wouldn't have shot in the air. He wouldn't have shot near it. He would have shot it. This guy would have shot. I, I'm under the impression he would have shot whatever it was, <laughs> if he thought it was, wasn't was human, be it a bear or whatever, I think he would have shot it. There's no animation in his voice, no big illustrators. And the temperature he's talking about goes up five degrees. It was from a perfect 30 degrees before, and now it's 35 degrees. So, oh, but it, it, I think we saw the video from later on. So I think it's gone down. So here's 35 degrees and in the later video, it's 30 degrees. So, and, um, a lot of this is probably true because I'm seeing a lot of, of indicators of, of truth here where he's talking about where he drove, how he parked and how far he walked, those kind of things. That's the truth part of it because you got to mix these things with the truth so you can really say, oh, you know how far that is, it's this, all these things happen. And he tells that and so it looks and sounds like the whole, like the whole thing is going to be true. And his skill at repeating the same thing has as, as really gotten stronger from even the first video there. So he start, he's, he's got that that old classic storytelling down where he can create that picture in your mind. Now he's gotten to where he tells a story to, and he, as he goes through it and realizes it wasn't human, he, it, it wasn't human, he still doesn't shoot it, even though he knows it's not human, but it's too human looking. So he goes from knowing there's, from knowing there's no escaped gorillas to wondering if there were any escaped gorillas. Or I guess here he was wondering if from knowing if later on that there weren't any uh, th this is just a master storyteller i don't think it gets much better than this all right chase what do you got i just you guys covered all the markers that i had so i'm going to cover every single truth signal in here just to make this interesting all the truth signals that might be present and when we say truth we mean that person believes it let's make that clear 
So it's kind of similar to the initial video. He's comfortable using his head as he narrates the story, and he's using his head to say where things are. He's comfortable with the story. The details seem extremely similar to the initial video. A couple of things that change that kind of like Greg talked about war stories. The tone of his voice varies with baseline, and I think it's consistent with an incident recall. So when he starts telling stuff, this is just great storytelling here. And there's body narration uh, with the story. There's the deer foaming at the mouth. He's There's some narration there. The tree stand. And when he says, out of my peripheral vision, uh, there was a short little eye and hand move together. So hands and eyes kind of move to the same side. And as human beings, if you believe you're alone and you see movement in your peripheral vision, that's a big deal. And when you're maybe telling the story to help someone realize how big of a deal it was. That might be the reason that he's kind of doing this and maybe gesturing uh, out of frame. Just, just throwing it out there. But the eyes were wide and surprised when he's mentioning gorilla looking thing. Uh, when he says the hair is shiny like this, he does this little gesture. I think without even, there's no rehearsal to that. I don't think whatsoever. But when he says there's a sinister looking face, it, he matches it with his eyebrows. You can see him squint and narrow his eyebrows. And he does it so quickly that I think he is unconcerned with our awareness of that facial expression, which suggests unrehearsed behavior. And in behavior profiling, I try to pay attention to two main elements. Number one, things that are hard to fake. And number two, things that are outside our awareness or things that happen unconsciously. And I think a lot of those are what I saw here. So just keep those two things in mind as we're as we're moving forward. That's all I got. Oh, yeah. OK, I give that to you, Chase. All right. Thank you. And so. Why don't you go ahead and um, tell us about the experiences that you had? Uh, the first experience, uh, the, I've had I had a visual before this one, but I wasn't sure it was a bear. But the one that that, that happened, uh, the physical experience, was back in December of 1981. I was deer hunting. Uh, I went down the main highway, turned off on a secondary road, went about two miles back in a game reserve and took a left down Old Logging Road. The Old Logging Road went about a mile back and dead ended. That's where I put my deer stand at the dead end. And I would park my truck halfway between there, about at the half mile mark, you know, because I didn't want to spook the deer driving in there. Well, I was sitting on my stand one uh, December day. Temperature was about 35 degrees, nice weather for deer hunting. And uh, I was facing north. And uh, uh, the timber to the right of me was real, real thick. You couldn't even walk through it. There were so many briars, so many tight trees. Well, I was sitting there, and I was looking north, and uh, this little young doe come running up to my deer stand. I mean, she was real, real young. Uh, usually deer run away from you, but she run up to my deer stand and actually laid down in front of my deer stand, touching the deer stand. It was a lean-to ladder up against a tree. Well, she was panting, she was just foaming at the mouth, she'd been running hard. Well, the first thing that entered my mind, uh, there's a big buck chasing her. Well, out of my peripheral vision, I saw something to the right of me about 20 yards. And as I looked, it jumped behind a tree. And when I looked, it was a big, black, tall, hairy, gorilla-looking thing you know, standing behind a tree looking at me. And I first thought of somebody in a suit playing jokes on me. So here I am, you know, I'm, I'm chewing this thing out. I'm telling, hey, you know, take your head off. This ain't no joke, you know. I'm sick of it, you know, you know, made me mad. Get out of here. Well, this thing is just looking at me, you know, as I talk, it's looking up and down and, and, and checking me out. And so this goes on a total of 15 minutes and, uh, uh, I get to looking at it, and uh, the hair is just real shiny, you know. And I'm getting to thinking, man, somebody did a good job on that suit. And then uh, questions started popping through my head, like, is there a circus in town? Did a gorilla break out? You know, no. 
uh, how could somebody come from that direction as thick and tight as it is? I couldn't even do it, you know. No. Well, all of a sudden, uh, this, th this thing, I got to notice in its eyes. And uh, its eyes was real, real evil, real sinister looking, you know, the look it was giving me. And I was thinking, how can a human do that? So I took my rifle, and it was a three by nine scope. I turned it down to three real low because the thing was right on top of me. And I picked my rifle up, I looked down at it, and I looked at its face, and I could tell that, uh, hey, this, there's something here. You know, this, this is a real deal. You know, I, I'm in a, I've got a count right here. You know, I've got a problem. And when I looked at him through the scope, he growled at me real, real loud. It made him, I mean, the, it, it went to horrible. He got really, really mad. I mean, he got, to, he got real antsy, you know. He got, he got froggy on me, you know. And then I got nervous. But when he growled, over about 100 yards away from him, there was a sharp whistle, a real, real shrill whistle. Well, he looked over at that direction, and he whistled back the same way. He whistled. The whistle came to him. Well, he looked at me and kind of grinned. But when he did that, I climbed down that 10-foot stand about to 7 foot more. And at that time, I was in pretty good shape. I was 25 years old, about 150 pounds, and I could move. Well, I jumped off that stand, you know, and I took off running. And my legs felt like they weighed 200 pounds apiece. Well, I noticed over to my right, he was flanking me. He was running through the woods. So here I am, I've got a half a mile to get to my truck, but I feel like I'm not gonna make it, you know. Well, I'm running hard as I can. He's over there to me about 20 yards, running beside me. Well, when I, I got to thinking, what am I gonna do when I get to my truck? How am I gonna have time to unlock it without him getting on top of me? Well, when I got up to my truck, I turned to my left to where he was coming and I fired a, a shot just to try to buy myself some time. And I almost hit him in the head. Almost, I mean, the bullet was about, three foot from, it hit a tree in front of his head. Well, I got my truck unlocked, I was driving off, I looked in the rear view mirror, and the other one was coming up behind me on a logging road. All right, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so there's a vocal click at the start of this one, that's that kind of thing that happens. Now, normally I'd be a bit concerned about that, but I think that's just a piece of punctuation and we don't we don't hear it in many other places so i'm not worried about that let's discount that uh i really like when he's talking about that 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 uh, the creature is getting i think it's antsy and froggy i like that idea something getting froggy and uh, that's great and he's, the, there's a shoulder sway of bravado from him so he's kind of acting out the 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 character and, and i think that's a, not a bad thing again because he's he's inhabiting he's personifying it's 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 really good storytelling and can point to something being quite true and and accurate but here's my problem when he starts to talk about the chase there's a massive tempo change now Fair enough, he's now into the chase sequence. So the storytelling could be changing because he's now into this, this um, running situation, but, but it's too different. It's too different. So I don't think this chase, I'm starting to think this chase bit didn't happen. And there's some logic there that misses and there's half a mile missing in this story as well where nothing like what happened in that half mile just running or did you see other stuff or you getting exhausted what, were you panicking what was the feeling did you look did you get another look at anybody like how did you tell you where it's it's uh, it's all coming undone now uh but chase uh you're optimistic about it prove prove to me otherwise or convince me at least sure i'll give you the truth signals here because i I told you I'm biased. You got a little bias going on. So as a, a quick pro tip when discussing optics, the first number is magnification. The second number is usually the diameter of the objective lens, the front lens. And so I think it means 329, not 3 by 9 which means adjustable magnification. So he's rocking it down to minimum mag. But when he says, I looked at its face, he makes a very small sneer on his face, indicating that he's witnessing some kind of expression. 
in his mind, or that this was his emotional reaction to seeing the face in general. There's something here. The, this is the real deal. We hear that little thing come out. Eyes are widening. There's a brief expression of an eyebrow flash that's fleeting enough that it wasn't planned. I think this is a genuine feeling and expression so far. The eyebrow flashes are usually fleeting in most cases, and there are ex exceptions to that. But when we hear him say he growled at me, uh, if this was an artificial story, you'd be more likely to hear words of a narrator instead of the first person. Like, I heard him growl. Instead, he's looking at the creature so he knows where it's coming from. And this is common in false stories when you hear things like this. Like, I realized I wasn't alone in the room. You could just say, I wasn't alone in the room. Or I noticed two men were standing in the doorway. You could say, two men were standing in the doorway. So that's narrator versus first person experience. And he says, to my right, he was flanking me, gestures, and he looks to his left. He says to my right and looks to his left. I thought that was unusual there. So that's one big thing I'll, I'll call out on that one. Uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, you're dead on. That one where he it says it was on the right, but he uses his left hand when he's talking about it and looks over there. Now, maybe the camera is reversed, but we if you pay attention later, you'll see that he uses his right hand when he's talking about the right. So we're pretty sure that that's correct. There's a lot of technical details here. A person who's using this level of technical details is using their knowledge of wood, woods lore and that kind of thing. So that they have credibility automatically because you're not going to challenge him on that. When he starts talking about gun caliber and he's talking to some Hollywood guy, he probably has no idea what he's talking about. doesn't really matter when he talks about magnification of scope. That's just a technical thing that he's so comfortable with he can lean on and it's going to give him a space. Now, here's a couple of interesting things. Every hunter I've ever listened to tell stories, even though I didn't want to hear most of them, they would do the same thing. It would take longer for the occurrence to happen in their story than it actually took in real life. That's what we're seeing here. There are a couple of things here. We talk about stories needing a trigger and that trigger then being having a the need to to create or fabricate your story and then deconflict it before you pitch it. Well, he's done most of that and nobody is challenging him. So if he's also doing something that Scott and I have referred to as the romancer, he's paying really close eye contact to you when he's telling you this story, just looking to see if they're buying in. I would lean into him and ask a few questions. Wait a minute. Okay. I understand you were 20, 21. How did you, these guys were right there. You said they were right there by you close enough that you could looking through your scope, see their face and see all this stuff. They're whistling, they're growling, they're doing all this stuff, but you couldn't outrun, you could outrun them for a half mile. You, you outran these things that live in the woods that have to catch their own food because they apparently don't have weapons in that. You outran these things. How'd that happen? I would just ask that question and put him on notice that I'm, I'm onto his BS, but he's not forced to deconflict this thing. So he's rattling along telling this story is if a couple of you, you hit it dead on though, Chase, everything else is pretty smooth until he starts illustrating off here or there. We, we just let him go and we don't cause him to go into a spiral of a lie. That's part of why he's there. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now we've got a Bigfoot that grins. We've got one that's thinking stuff. And he puts this idea in our head because he wants us to think it's something bad because it's thinking, oh, I got you now. Or what is it thinking when it's, when it's doing that? And it's, it's not good, whatever it is. And it's just like a movie. It's just like, it's just like something you, you would watch. Kafka said, every man is necessarily the hero of his own story. And that's what he is. He's the hero of his own story here. And that and it could be a movie if you think about it. It has action, suspense, danger, guns, monsters, and fast cars. Everything you need for a hit movie. Everything you see at the movies today, that thing has in it. He's got that figured out. He knows how to, how to tell a story, how to sell something. And that's what he's doing. <laughs> anyway. So I think he's a, a he's a great storyteller, and that's what we're seeing in here. And is a great storyteller who's building that picture in your mind. And he's doing a dang good job of it, and and I'm sure, I'm sure that's why it was so easy to buy because you could tell the story really easily. And he sees himself getting on TV, which is he's starting to here in the Skookum thing. We were talking in between this, we were talking about how Skookum <laughs> sounds dirty. <laughs> we don't know what it is, but it doesn't sound right. All right, we good? Yeah. So I took my rifle and it was a three by nine scope. I turned it down to three real low. 
because the thing was right on top of me. And I picked my rifle up, I looked down at it, and I looked at its face, and I could tell that, uh, hey, this, there's something here. You know, this, this is a real deal. You know, I, I'm in a, I've got a count right here. You know, I've got a problem. And when I looked at him through the scope, he growled at me real, real loud. It made him, I mean, the, it, it went to horrible. He got really, really mad. I mean, he got, to, he got real antsy, you know. He got, he got froggy on me, you know. And then I got nervous. But when he growled, over about 100 yards away from him, there was a sharp whistle, a real, real shrill whistle. Well, he looked over at that direction, and he whistled back the same way. He whistled. The whistle came to him. Wow. Well, he looked at me and kind of grinned. But when he did that, I climbed down that 10-foot stand about to 7 foot more. And at that time, I was in pretty good shape. I was 25 years old, about 150 pounds, and I could move. Well, I jumped off that stand, you know, and I took off running. And my legs felt like they weighed 200 pounds a piece. Well, I noticed over to my right, he was flanking me. He was running through the woods. So here I am, I've got a half a mile to get to my truck, but I feel like I'm not going to make it, you know. Well, I'm running hard as I can. He's over there to me about 20 yards, running beside me. Well, when I, I got to thinking, what am I going to do when I get to my truck? How am I going to have time to unlock it without him getting on top of me? Well, when I got up to my truck, I turned to my left to where he was coming, and I fired a, a shot just to try to buy myself some time. And I almost hit him in the head. I almost, I mean, the bullet was about three foot from, it hit a tree in front of his head. Well, I got my truck unlocked. I was driving off. I looked in the rear view mirror, and the other one was coming up behind me on a logging road. His partner that I guess he had signaled that there was a situation was trailing me, which I didn't know he was trailing me because I didn't look back. I was looking over to my left. Well, I got him a truck, and I mean, I just almost blew the engine up getting out of there. And uh, uh, I was really in a depression uh, for about several years. Uh, I, would, I would deer hunt and uh, uh, I quit that area and moved over to a new area about seven, eight miles from there. And also over there I had five or six sightings. And I saw how they would get under trees, under uh, cedar trees and lay on their bellies and they would catch turkeys coming in. I seen that from my deer stand, how they would, they would do turkeys that was roosting. They would wait on them. So uh, I've, I've had quite a bit of uh, experience with these things, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's awesome. Well, that's a great story. Greg, what do you got? So here now he is illustrating with his left hand when he's talking about the left, which makes us more suspect of the last time when he said he was off to the left and used his right hand. So a little bit weird. He's making hard eye contact now, a lot of eye contact, more than he should. We always say that too much eye contact is a bad thing. We're raised in, in the U.S. to always believe that breaking eye contact is deception. Usually it's the other way, and all four of us will tell you, too much eye contact makes us uncomfortable. Um the only eye accessing, mess, I see him do it all, meaning looking around in his head, is when he's talking about being depressed for a while. Now, wait a minute. Now he's had five or six sightings? Wait a minute. What, how'd that happen? I thought the one that happened was, no, There. now we get, this is when you lean on this guy and you start asking him questions. You say, wait a minute, you told me earlier the one that happened was this. Now you got five or six. And I'm going to call BS on any animal laying on its belly and grabbing a turkey. I'm just going to call BS. I live in the woods. Turkeys are pretty damn smart. Not the domestic kind, wild turkeys. Anybody who hunts will tell you they're some of the smartest animals they ever have to deal with. So he knows that. He's going to do whatever it takes. I think he's fishing for how far he can go here. That's a pretty bold statement. I've seen a whole bunch of them, and I've seen them laying on their belly and grabbing turkeys is a little weird. I just that, – that seems a – of all the things he said, if he'd stuck with the original story, we probably would be okay. And after he says that and he goes to It's Awesome – he does a lip withdrawal, which we usually associate with someone wanting approval for their message. So I think he's keenly aware that some of what he's saying may be perceived as not as less than true. And he's just going to float it out there and see where it goes. Scott, what do you got? All right. Now this Bigfoot has a partner. So he's seen two Bigfoots. 
big feet, however you say it grammatically correct in that world. And even through his depression, he was seeing groups of them, like you were saying, Greg, hiding and waiting and doing stuff, like catching turkeys and things, like there's a big herd of them out there near where he lives. But you know what he didn't do? Having said all that and seen all that, having done all that, the one thing he didn't do ever was take a camera. Didn't, didn't take a video camera, didn't do anything. He could have. It'd been really, really easy because he's seen so many of them. You think, well, if I go out today and see one, his wife would have said, why don't you take your camera with you? Or next time you're out there, just pull your phone out and take a picture, man. Nothing, nothing, not once. So that makes me go, this guy, it's just, I wish I could be with you on this chase, but I, I just can't do it, man. I can't. I'm I'll take it a step phone. further. I, I know they're not endangered and I got a 270 with me. I might just have to have one of those. <laughs> There's no limit. Stuff it. It's not regulated. You know, I know there's a lot of them. What the hell? They won't miss one. Stuff it and put it out in the front yard. <laughs> I, I'd be the guy who has Bigfoot stuffed at my house. You'd be the guy. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, look, I, I'm going to say fair play in a video coming up. He is going to say that he does have photographs of them. And we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens when he says he's got he's got photographs. So, so wait on that one. Uh, but... But here's what I've got on this. It becomes grandiose, almost blew that engine up. <laughs> yeah, it's like a grandiose idea. And then a look for approval after that. So he knows it's a, it's a big bunch of cards he's just played and he wants the engagement of the, uh, of the viewer at that point. Uh, the several years of, of, of depression. Listen, terrible if you have, have depression and very difficult to be honest about it, to say, hey, I, I had depression for seven years. I think that's played though, because honesty will equal honesty. If he's honest about that, then surely he's being honest about everything else, especially something which is socially very, very sensitive, especially at that, at that time that he's telling that story. To say you've had depression for a long time, if you're honest about that, you wouldn't be lying about other stuff. Um, yeah, they've now got friends, he's socialized, he's, he's literally setting up social groups it's going to get even more extreme in 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 a, in a moment's time which is great listen here's my biggest thing is uh, i've had quite a bit of experience with these things i've had quite a bit of experience well, what do you mean quite a bit like how much like exactly how much these things what, what things like tell me about describe the thing tell me about the thing name it give it a name Give, give me give me way more detail on that and his blink rate is right up at that point so i don't like it i don't like it i really liked it at the start i'd love for this to be true and it's it, it's going in another direction for me uh maybe he'll turn it around uh chase what do you got though yeah so right at the depression for several years there's down left eye accessing and we move our eyes to access our brain in different different ways. And so we associate the down left with internal dialogue, somebody talking to themselves or rehearsing. Uh, even if it's truthful, then I would assume this would be him considering how to word this socially for the video. But if it's deceptive, this might mean he's running through what's about to be said and how it's going to sound in his head. And as a quick note, the word deer hunt is actually used as a verb uh, in the South, uh, very regularly. I grew up about two and a half hours from where that guy lives. And it skips all over these other experiences. Like, oh, yeah, I saw that one thing one time. And then I've had several other experiences. Just skips right over that stuff. But then he details observing how they hunt. I think that's pretty suspicious. As another quick note, when he says it's awesome, I think this might be a more religious or church-based use of the word. He may be referring to how Southern churches commonly use this word awesome to describe God, uh, creation of life, and stuff like that. And they are in awe of what's happening. That's all I got. I'm going to go with Mark. Mark's a professional. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, because I am a professional that I guess he had signaled that there was a situation was trailing me, which I didn't know he was trailing me. 
because I didn't look back. I was looking over to my left. Well, I got in my truck, and I mean, I just almost blew the engine up getting out of there. And uh, uh, I was really in a depression uh, for about several years. Uh, I wouldn't I would deer hunt, and uh, uh, I quit that area and moved over to a new area about seven, eight miles from there. And also over there, I had five or six sightings. And I saw how they would get under trees, under uh, cedar trees, and lay on their bellies, and they would catch turkeys coming in. I seen that from my deer stand, how they would, they would do turkeys that was roosting. They would wait on them. So uh, I've, I've had quite a bit of uh, experience with these things. And uh, it's it's uh, it's it's awesome. Well, that's a great story. The next question plays into your story. So tell us what you think. You know, what is the nature of these creatures? Obviously, if they wanted to hurt you, they probably could have. Um, yes. Uh, what, what what is the nature of these guys? What's their intentions? I don't. I, I feel like um, the reason uh, when you hear cases of people being attack to run out. I, I feel like this is their their home. Their, you're, you're in their home and you're trespassing. And uh, I, I feel like uh, I don't think they mean harm to anybody. Uh, I think they're kind of like people. Uh, you know you have thugs, uh, you have crooks, uh, you have uh, athletes, uh, you have movie stars. You have all kind of different walk, people walks of life, and I think their attitudes. Each animal is, has got his own attitude. I, I, I think the one that uh, got after me, run me off my stand. Uh, he was probably seven foot tall, uh, 450, 500 pounds, great shape, muscular build. I would say he was uh, in his early 20s. What would you? What kind of advice would you give somebody that's in a similar situation to you, which? Rarely happens. Your situation is, is rare. What, would you, what, what advice would you give somebody that finds himself face to face with this aspect? First off, try not to make eye contact. Uh, don't point. Uh, don't point any weapons at it. Uh, the best thing to do is to quietly uh, move away from it. Uh, don't don't make any advances because these animals are awesome. I mean, they can they can rip a human in two. As a tiger can rip your face off with one swat. How big would you say the creatures that you saw were? Well, I've saw some 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 babies. I mean, I've I've saw some babies that's probably four foot tall, 150 200 pounds. Uh, I've saw some probably bumping eight foot tall, probably five five fifty six hundred pounds. All right, uh, Chase, what do you got? You want me to cover truth or uh, potential deception? <laughs> oh, I'd love to hear some truth if you have some. Me too. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll cover the potentially truthful point. For you. Love it. I'm going to do my best. <laughs> well, that was Chase Hughes. Now <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? So, <laughs> there is a shift to internal dialogue at the beginning. So... Number one, that could be I'm rehearsing, you know, what I've said before, which doesn't necessarily indicate a lie. Uh, right when they said if they wanted to hurt you, they probably could have. There's an immediate shift to down center, which we typically associate with self-reflection. So he's pondering the question, is he? Or is he pondering, like, maybe if one of those varmints existed, could they actually whoop my ass? Maybe he's doing that if they existed. Who knows? Everything here might look a little more honest, uh, with a few exceptions, which uh, I'm sure all what these guys say won't amount to very much. His routine shift to internal dialogue is inconsistent with his baseline. So that might be a damning thing. But if you consider the individual difference between recalling an event you experienced or believed to have experienced, that might be the key versus someone asking you a question about your internal thoughts and feelings about that event, you're no longer recalling, you're processing information because they're asking you to do so. Hopefully that was semi-good. Scott, I'll let you have it. Yeah. All right. 
Well, once again, he's seen everything from baby big feet to gym rat big feet, from killers to teenagers, and thugs. didn't get a picture. Yeah, thugs, didn't get a picture, not once. He's breaking them down into personality types about what they like and they don't like at this point. Now, remember, we don't. nobody has a good picture of one. Nobody has a video, but he's already broken them down personality-wise as to what's going on with them. He knows what makes them angry. He knows what makes them, uh, what pointing does to them, how that makes them mad, and how you're in their home, and that makes them mad. Now, I'm, like a, I'm not going to focus a lot on body language here, but if I was this guy, here's what I'd do. Since I'd know so much about them, I'd give them hats and little pipes and some little purses and things. I'd get them a cat and I'd build them a house and I'd rig it with all these cameras and stuff. And I have a subscription only YouTube channel. It would be called Scott Rouse's Bigfoot Reality. And then I'd teach them how to smoke cigarettes and, and teach them how to cuss and have them out there dancing around, drinking beer and telling loud, nasty jokes and put them on unicycles. And then you pay like 10 bucks a month to watch this on youtube live what else happening with them and if you went there you could pay 40 bucks and you can go in and pay 10 bucks for a coke to get them like they do those bears out in Gat gatlinburg where they catch a bear and you feed it a coke for 10 bucks that's what i'd be doing at this point but i'm sure they'd form a union and you know kick me out but at that point i'd have like a monocle and a cane and i'd take on some weird accent and be you know like welcome to you know whatever you know like they they did on that uh, dinosaur show that's what i'd do anyway Greg, what do you got? No, no, I know exactly what he should do for a living. He should be the guest, the weight of the Bigfoot at the Bigfoot Fair. Because he's oh, dead man. on about every one of those I'm weights. Use that if weights. That's okay. <laughs> weights and heights. He almost smiles. Here's what I love. And Chase, you're right. There's one place where I see honesty. And it's because the questioner just absolutely sucks. And the questioner asks him a conjecture question. What do you think the nature of the Bigfoot is? Well, he has to go internal conversation because he's got to think up. Well, I don't know. What, what do you want me to tell you? It, then we get into the whole science of Bigfootery, as I said a long time ago. Every time you talk to these guys, there's all kinds of stuff like they communicate with rocks and they whistle. And if you watch them on TV, people really believe this stuff. They've seen them. They all believe that. That's his baseline when he isn't prepared, when he starts going to an internal conversation and he's trying to respond. Interestingly, he almost smiles. You see that almost break of a smile when the guy says, this is a great story. I love that because I think he's like, yep, this is a great story. I think he knows. But then he goes on to trespass. When he says trespass, there's a pregnant pause there. And when, when a person does that pregnant pause, they're waiting for your reaction. He says, I think it's because they're trespassing. And my note, I said this to you, Scott, I think here begins the culture of Bigfoot. We're no longer <laughs> just talking about... We're no longer just talking about them as things we've seen. Now they're giving him a chance to pontificate on what they must be like. So now he doesn't have to lie. He can just make up whatever he wants because they're asking his opinion. Don't point no eye contact. For God's sake, don't point a weapon at them and do not laugh is what I have in my notes. And you might piss them off. And there's the inevitable tiger reference. Mark, there's a tiger <laughs> reference here. We had to have it. They'll tear your face off like a tiger. Hmm. I don't know. Guys, this started off being kind of believable because that's what editing does. This is getting more and more comical as we go. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Uh, yeah. Yeah. So number one, I think that the Scott Rouse Circus Sideshow would be fantastic. <laughs> and, and I look forward. I look forward to that good old Southern entertainment. <laughs> well, they'll sell cars oh, too. So if you need some yeah. color, good old car. Southern entertainment, Scott Rouse Circus Sideshow. Bigfoot Bonanza. So <laughs> coming, coming to a YouTube channel near you. Yeah, uh, no, you here's know. what it, but here's, here's the, the only two things I can add. Here's what it is, Scott. It's the Smurfs. This is, this is basically <laughs> what the Smurfs was. I mean, obviously the Smurfs were smaller, but they live in a forest and they all have little professions, you know, and they have arguments and they, they just have this. It's, it's like any woodland folk. Essentially, it's 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 fairies, it's pixies, it's gnomes, it's the Smurfs, you know, and they always have, and they've got little bags and they they do all their little chores and they've got all this family stuff going on and they have little disputes with each other and for an episode and I mean it's it's the beautiful stuff of of that and that's what he's inventing. Why? Because we love that kind of idea. It's a great great idea, as the guy says. It's this is this is a great story. Um, but it goes another direction for me when he says they can rip a human in two. Well, when did you see that? 
I mean, you're just conjecturing that. Like, I think, I think they could, or I saw them rip this thing into a deer into. So I reckon they could rip a human being into. No, he says they can rip a human. When did you, when did you see that happen? To know that to be true, it's like nobody asks that. Nobody asks that. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Like now, I've just got look. I've just got how disappointing. How disappointing. I'm really because I really wanted. I really wanted this to go somewhere, and now it's now it's an episode of the Smurfs. Anyway, let's see if it gets any any better. That's all I got on that one. You know what this is? He he wants you to be afraid of it, but he has a special relationship. This is scary in the Hendersons. Right, <laughs> right, <laughs> right. You yeah. know, the sad part is I, when I first watched the first video, I was like, hey, this looks pretty credible. Yeah. I then was. I started looking. Yeah. You yeah. look at video one, it's nothing like, yeah. you know, that yeah. first one, nothing like this. Yeah. Hang on, buckle up. It gets a lot better. <laughs> He's going to talk about the one that's an ENTJ. <laughs> <laughs> Nailed it. The next question plays into your story. So tell us what you think and what is the nature of these creatures? Obviously, if they wanted to hurt you, they probably could have. Um, Yes. uh, What what is the nature of these guys? What's their intentions? I don't, I I feel like um, the reason uh, when you hear cases of people being uh, attacked or run out, I I feel like this is their their home. You're you're in their home and you're trespassing. And, I feel like uh, I don't think they mean harm to anybody. Uh, I think they're kind of like people. Uh, you know, you have thugs, uh, you have crooks, uh, you have uh, athletes, uh, you have movie stars. You have all kind of different walk- people walks of life. And I think their attitudes, each animal has is, is got his own attitude. I, I, I think the one that uh, got after me, run me off my stand, uh, he was probably seven foot tall, uh, 450, 500 pounds, great shape, muscular build. I would say he was uh, in his early 20s. What, would you, what kind of advice would you give somebody that's in a similar situation to you, which rarely happens, your situation is, is rare. What, would you, what, what advice would you give somebody that finds himself face to face with a Sasquatch? First off, try not to make eye contact. Uh, don't point. Uh, don't point any weapons at it. Uh, the best thing to do is to quietly uh, move away from it. Uh, don't don't make any advances because these animals are awesome. I mean, they can they can rip a human in two. As a tiger can rip your face off with one swat. How big would you say the creatures that you saw were? Well, I've saw some, some, some babies. I mean, I've, I've saw some babies that's probably four foot tall, 150, 200 pounds. Uh, I've saw some probably bumping eight foot tall, probably five, 550, 600 pounds. The reason I didn't shoot it is it was just too, uh, just too human. The, the face, uh, it was a bipedal. You know, it walked two legs on two legs, just like we did, but it was just too human. Uh, the, the face was too human. Uh, the eyelashes, uh, the teeth, the jaw structure, the forehead, uh, it was light brown. The face was light brown, like it had a dark suntan. But I, I couldn't pull the trigger because uh, something told me this ain't right. It's not the right thing to do. So here's what he got. Yeah, so the reason we plug this one in here is because all that credibility up front is because he's telling a story without anyone challenging. He's just been challenged here. He's asked, why didn't you shoot it? Well, look, okay, I get why you didn't shoot the first one. Why wouldn't you shoot some of these later ones, the ones that were scaring you and doing that kind of thing? But it'll get better. Let's just hang in there. So here what we do, he's got way too much eye contact. And then he is... um, I think when he's looking off to the to the side there, it's because he's looking off at some kind of some part of the crew that's there to film. But this is what should have happened earlier, and he would not have looked as credible as he did in the very first part of this video. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, I just, for some reason, I don't feel like talking about deception here. Uh, I'm just going to talk about something else. Let's talk about the psychology of this. 
there's a shift to emotional recall. Actually, when he's thinking about why didn't I shoot this thing? You could see him go to emotional recall, eyes go down and right. I think this, if this happened, this might be logical as he's recalling the feeling of observing a human-like creature. And in, in Japanese psychology, this is referred to as the uncanny valley, where the closer a non-human thing is to a human, the more strange and uneasy it automatically makes us feel. Uh, so the, the other side of this spectrum is called automatonophobia. That's a real word. You can look it up which is an excessive fear of human-like objects. So in general, it's really common for people to feel weird or uncomfortable in the presence of human replicas. So like if you ever go to a, a store where there's mannequins and you just try this out, get your face close to that mannequin face, it will feel strange. So while there's a lot of figures like mannequins or robots that resemble humans, we inherently have the awareness that they're not real which gives us that feeling of being chilling or unsettling. I'll just leave that there. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, th there's going to be a lot of police calls from That's stores with going, <laughs> we've, got, we've got somebody in our store who's standing really close Sniffing to the mannequin. The they won't the weird move. feeling will be handcuffs. Right, right. Do they watch the behavior panel? Oh, uh, yeah, they do. Okay, that's why. There's been a lot of that going on this week. Wow. Okay. Um, look, here's what does make sense to his story. It does make sense that if he's seeing somewhat of a human face, that he may not shoot that. We have a, a, a wiring, a hard wiring, an instinct for us to, to not shoot other human beings. There's quite, you know, tough training to get people to, to shoot at other people. They tend to shoot wide if they see the face. It's really important. If they see those eyes, if they see a mouth, they'll shoot wide on that. It's so so I, 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 I get it. There's some rationality to, to that. And then he looks off, he eye avoids. Now I get your point, Greg, that he may be looking at, at, at somebody else, but why just then? Why use, why take that di distraction? Yeah, I think, I think he's come up with something plausible when, when put to the wire and questioned, he's come up with something in my mind that's plausible, but he doesn't quite believe it. And he's looking for approval elsewhere is the way I would, I would read that. Uh, Scott, what do you got on this one? All right, you guys covered what little there is there. So he claims to be a big hunter. That's his thing. That's all he talks about, hunting. Every time we t he talks, he talks about his hunting. And that's where he sees these things. And, of course, the easiest way, like you guys were saying, to get out of shooting it is to say it looks too human. He and then he details all the things to qualify his answer. And you're right, Greg. This is it's the first time he's been challenged. And in the liar's loop, you've got five parts. You've got the trigger. Because the guy butts up against him, so he's got to add more to that. He's got to start lying, so he fabricates the lie. Then he deconflicts it. Then he pitches. Then he has to defend it. He doesn't have a whole lot of time to deconflict in there. That's why it starts sounding weird, I think. So when he pitches again, he comes back and pitches. He he has to remember everything he's talked about so he can defend it so, um, well, defend it well. You know. So I think that's that's what we're seeing there. So you guys covered everything. That, but... I'll tell you one of my red flags there is just everything's too clean and clear as an overall. You know, I haven't said that part about the the defense part and the deconflict. It's really clean. It's really clear. So obviously it would be because through the years he's told this story so many times and he's just started adding, like I said at the beginning, little parts here and there, little parts. Now he's got a culture he's got for him. He's got everything you need to have, have the Smurfs, like Mark was saying, have a little town of them. You know, that's why I need to come watch my channel. Scott Rouse's Bigfoot Reality. Wait. The reason I didn't shoot it is it was just too, uh, just too human. The, the face, uh, it was a bipedal. You know, it walked two legs on two legs, just like we did. But it was just too human. Uh, the, the face was too human. Uh, the eyelashes, uh, the teeth, the jaw structure. The forehead, uh, it was light brown. The face was light brown, like it had a dark suntan. But I couldn't pull the trigger because uh, something told me this ain't right. It's not the right thing to do. Did something happen? Like when was the first time that, 
what how were you before Bigfoot before your awareness of Bigfoot well I never believed in it because you know I've been in the woods 50 something years in my life I've, I've seen a lot of stuff and, and, and a lot of stuff I've seen I wouldn't come back and tell nobody because it just to me it was unbelievable mm -hmm. you know uh, this plant I worked I worked at a large factory and uh, I seen stuff in that plant you know people would just have breakdowns lose their mind stuff like that and all kind of weird stuff would happen and uh, I'd come home and I'd tell my friend they said no that no way that didn't happen you know they, it was unbelievable in the same way out there you know I just you know keep to myself you right know? and uh, uh, because you know if, if a person got to where they was a hunter which is what I did and if they were a liar okay uh, you, you killed your uh, credibility with me. I took that serious. If I told you I killed 18 point buck, I killed 18 point buck. Right. You know, uh, I've got the I've got the racks lined up the house, all up to 20s. You know, big racks. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my thing. Uh, be honest. Just be yourself and be honest. I have walked seven miles. I parked my truck, and then way back then we didn't have four wheelers. We didn't have three wheelers. We didn't have none of that. And you know, I parked my truck and uh, uh, walked in six, seven miles. Been stuck before and walked out ten miles in the dark without a flashlight. Oh, uh, right, right. Oh, oh. You know, because that's how it goes. You know, and, and I, I, I bought a new truck one time in '78, and I, I went hunting. It's a really nice truck, and uh, I'll never forget uh, when I went in. I always check the tire tracks mm -hmm. to see if anybody's in there. Else, yeah, yeah. Well, when I got back to my truck, <clears throat> it was piled up. Somebody had piled a bed full of uh, limbs, and there was limbs all over the hood. And there wasn't no tracks coming in. Nobody had been in there. And and that was the time, that, that was in uh, 1978. Mm -hmm. which, November 78, there see my truck brand new, I just bought it. And it kind of got me upset. You know what I got? I'm going to go first on this one. I don't think the guy asking questions was prepared. I thought, <laughs> I'm going to know what to ask when I go in there because it's Mike Woolley, and I know all about Bigfoots because I'm a Bigfoot guy myself. That's why the, all the questions we're going to see from here on out are oddly delivered as he does that because he really hasn't sat down, didn't make a list. He wasn't prepared. He didn't prep for this. He keeps stroking his beard because th that's an example of, and that's an example of, of blending cues together where he's being unsure and it's a pacifier at the same time and we call that manipulating he's manipulating his beers goofing around with it at the same time it's a repetitive gesture repetitive cue so that lets us know it's an adapter so it's a blend of those two together and let's pay attention to the interview on the left he's he, as the videos go on he becomes more and more uncomfortable as he's realizing this is going way deeper than he thought it was going to be and the <laughs> was going to get a lot deeper too so watch him become more uncomfortable as things go along and the, and the little one over there with, with the beard he, it just keeps getting worse for him because he 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 is a true believer he's bought into this thing he he's in a hundred percent he's there now when mike starts talking about liars that other guy's leg starts to stretch out and starts making that little circle his foot starts making that little circle down there so he wants to say something so bad he doesn't know what because he's realizing he's going to look goofy on this i think that's the, that's the impression i've got and mike's over there selling it man he's over there not moving anywhere and and on him and he's just leaning into it hard and he's using what i learned from greg was one time i called greg and i said i'm dealing with a guy who who I think stolen some money and he's got this weird look on his face. And I said, I sent Greg a little clip of the video and you remember what you told me, Greg, that was yeah, his so. teaching face. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd never thought about that before, but that was perfect. And it was, and Mike Willie has on his teaching face. He's got that head reared back and he's telling him the way things are and all that. And that's what this guy was doing. And I didn't, it didn't look quite like that in the video. I sent Greg, but it was the same idea. I just, and I was like, that's brilliant. I've never seen that before. So he's educating him about the Bigfoot society that he's created in his head, because as the years go on, he's added all these things and he's had to sit home and think about that when he's laying up at night going, oh, I've got to add this to that. I've got to, that's how this world, this whole Bigfoot world he's created came to be because all these little things he's added to be more of a hero of his own story 
has created a monster for him and he's got to stay on top of that thing. So he's got to be the guy telling you all about it or he wants to be because at this point he is, especially in the, in the Bigfoot world. I can't believe we're doing this, you guys. (laughs) (laughs) Nobody's going to be watching this far anyway. Chase, what do you got? I was watching these videos at 5 a.m. in the restaurant in the hotel, which is empty this morning in in the, the guy who's making the coffee came by and says, oh, you're working early. He's like, what are you doing? And I said, Bigfoot. And he goes, oh. (laughs) (laughs) The first sign of fidgeting or stress here is where he's describing his friends not believing him. And I think this is a genuine sign of personal stress. The feet go crazy. Some people who might have just read a book on body language or something, see this little toes going up and see, oh, that's an anti-gravity gesture. They're like, that's celebration. No, feet are going crazy up and down, but only for that moment. And this is what I meant by change detection. We're seeing a change in behavior here. And as a quick rule of thumb, when we're talking about the feet, the further a body part is from the head, the harder it is to control during stress or tension, or as Mark might say, stress and pressure. So the second repetition of this is during the tire track statement. I think he knows that when he's talking about tire tracks, this is partially untruthful. Uh, This is an even higher spike in the stressful behavior. I don't think he always checked. I don't think, I think at this, if this thing actually happened, he forgot on this specific trip to the woods. When he's saying limbs and bed, he speaks about the truck in the same way, the bed, the hood, the bed. This sounds and appears semi-honest here. I can't point to a very direct indicator of deception for that. But there's something spiking in the behavior every time he mentions the truck being brand new in this video. You can see it in his feet and his hands here. And I'm doubtful the truck was brand new, but that's totally irrelevant as a detail, but relevant as a behavior that you can use to look at some of these videos that are coming up or some of the other interviews of him. I wish every video we analyzed on this channel had a full body shot like this, where we could see an entire human being with the feet in it. And if you want to practice when this video comes back on the screen, I want you to try this to train yourself for behavior profiling. You can watch his face and let your peripheral vision catch the movement of the feet and the other body parts. This is one thing you can totally train your brain to be more conscious of. And you can see a lot more than you think in your peripheral vision. I think I went a little long there. I apologize. Greg, what do you got? Yeah, so let's talk about that deception around the truck. I think there is a great indicator. He does a pregnant pause right when he says the hood, boom, he stops. People don't do that except for to see what your reaction is going to be. And people do that about meeting a celebrity. You know, I met Dr. Phil and they stop. They give a pause so that you respond. That's what they're doing it for. It's a fishing move. He also, that thing that you were talking about with his feet, instead of it being, I agree with you, instead of it being gravity defying, I see it as a territory stomp. It's ba-boom, ba-boom. When he's, he does it every time, we'll pick it up and you'll be able to see. Here's, for me, the interesting piece. The guy on the right, if you're looking at the two interviewers, is enamored of this guy, clearly. I mean, you just can't miss it. And he is in his teaching spot or holding court. If one of us was sitting talking to people and they're asking us about what we do, it's the same effect. They're all circling around and listening. But the guy on the left gets it because when he says lie, you see that foot. It's like, hmm, something's up. The other one is, okay, wait a minute. I come here to talk to you about Bigfoot. And now where are you going to tell me that weird stuff is happening in the plant where you used to work? I'm out of here. I'm done. That story's <laughs> over right there. I now know you're a ghost story guy. And whatever happens, you probably wear a tinfoil hat. I'm going to go after that. And you just say, yeah, that's that. Um, He does a single shoulder shrug at um, breakdown. And then he goes into this whole qualifying his expertise. This is almost like a magic trick, almost like sleight of hand. If I give you enough woods lore that I appear to be Davy Crockett, then anything I say about the woods must be true. And that's the approach he's taking is he's just spilling all this data about the woods that people may or may not know. And that makes it hard to challenge him. 
once he's got this guy, once he's gotten them down, then he starts telling all kinds of stuff. And I think now it's it's an age old, once I qualify myself here through my resume statement, to use your words, Chase, about all I know about the woods. Now, I you could not have possibly seen what I've seen. Look, even at the plant, I saw things that other people didn't see. So look, I'm the guy. This is kind of a chest beating alpha male, if you will, of big footery. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, the, the beauty of this for me, like you were saying, Scott, is is watching those guys who are interviewing him and 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 looking at how different they are in terms of their optimism and skepticism about it. I love it when uh, when the guy says, um, "Be yourself and be honest," and there's a big adapter from one of them around that who's who is not quite sure uh, honesty is is really at play here. One last thing to say about this just a great example of how not to ask a question because he goes through Dior did something like when what how were before before awareness i mean he goes all goes through so many different themes and and options to get to well i don't know what the question is at the end actually and so woolly gets to answer it with with a prepped reflection with a with a prepped idea uh what could have been actually quite a good reflexive question is just mangled mercilessly at the start did something happen like when was the first time that uh, what how were you before bigfoot before your awareness of bigfoot well i never believed in it because you know, I've been in the woods 50 something years of my life. I've, I've seen a lot of stuff. And, and, and a lot of stuff I've seen, I wouldn't come back and tell nobody because it just, to me, it was unbelievable. You know, uh, this plant I worked on, I worked on a large factory, and uh, I seen stuff in that plant, you know, people would just have breakdowns, lose their minds, stuff like that. And all kind of weird stuff would happen. And uh, I'd come home and I'd tell my friend, they said, no, that, no way, that didn't happen. You know, that, it was unbelievable. In the same way out there, you know, I just, you know, keep to myself, you know? right? And uh, uh, because, you know, if, if a person got to where they was a hunter, which is what I did, and if they were a liar, okay, uh, you, you killed your uh, credibility with me. I took that serious. If I told you I killed 18 point buck, I killed 18 point buck. Right. You know, uh, I've, got the, I've got the racks lined up the house, all the way up to 20s. You know, big rags. Mm -hmm. uh, that was my thing. Uh, be honest. Just be yourself and be honest. I have walked seven miles. I parked my truck, and then way back then we didn't have four wheelers, we didn't have three wheelers, we didn't have none of that. And you know, I parked my truck and uh, uh, walked in six, seven miles. Been stuck before and walked out ten miles in the dark without a flashlight. Oh, right, right. Oh, you know, because that's how it goes. You know, and, and I, I, I bought a new truck one time in '78, and I, I went hunting. It's a really nice truck, and uh, I'll never forget uh, when I went in. I always check the tire tracks mm -hmm. to see if anybody's in there. Else, yeah, yeah. Well, when I got back to my truck, <clears throat> it was piled up. Somebody had piled a bed full of uh, limbs, and there was limbs all over the hood, and. There wasn't no tracks coming in. Nobody had been in there. And and that was the time, that, that was in uh, 1978. Mm -hmm. November 78, there see my truck brand new, I just bought it. And it kind of got me upset, you know. I, got I know how it feels to walk with a rifle and have that feed you back and kind of bolster you up, make you stand tall. And if you're very skilled with that rifle, you should stand tall. Yeah. How do you feel now about having a rifle and not just because of your own experience, but your knowledge of Bigfoot, these creatures? And what does that rifle speak to you now in terms of what confidence that you should hold up? I'll give you a good example. Yes. When I was hunting that day, I had a 270. Correct. One of the finest deer rifles around. Uh, shoots a 130 grain bullet, which is not a big bullet, but it's a good flat shooting bullet. Kill my mm -hmm. deer with it. Uh, he, uh, that creature made me uh, feel like I had a BB gun. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm getting ready, uh, hopefully near 
I'm going to go elk hunting, start elk hunting. And I found this rifle uh, down at a dealership in Houston, Texas, where they have rifles from boy back when you were a kid. kid. And they had the gun was brand new. And so I bought a 300 Magnum. I said, this time when I go, you know, yeah. it ain't gonna be no little 270s and 30 out sixes. I got 300 bag to BAR. Right. Right. Something that's, you know, shooting some pretty good lead if I have to. Because, you know, that's what I happened that day. I had a seven millimeter Magnum and, and it'd make that 270 look like a BB gun. Right. right. Categorical I mean, difference. Just, I mean, uh, you know, I set targets up. A friend one day we were shooting and we were shooting at 100 yards and he shot my 270 at a, a, a tree shooting a target and I hear the bullet you know but when he shot that 7 mag it was just and then pow yeah that bullet hit and it went out the back of a tree the tree was that big around he went not that impressed the heck out of me right and, and and it's always come down to it you know what would I have done if I'd had that 7 mag that day mm -hmm. I don't know if he could have intimidated me as bad, you know. And so that's why I bought this big caliber rock with this 300 Magnum. And that's what you have now. Yeah, so when I do the way I'm cutting, mm -hmm. I'll be toting that. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I mean, there's just one thing on that for me, which is the idea of I bought a 300 uh, Magnum, so it must be true. I mean, because I went out and purchased this thing, obviously... It must be true. He does. He does let go of the idea that he, he was actually shooting elk, and his and his two seventy wasn't really adequate for that. And so there is an alternative reason for buying a three hundred. But he's kind of going, look. Obviously, <laughs> I went out and purchased this, so must be must be true. Uh, that's all I got on that one because it for me it just starts to talk talk specific tech that he knows is going to draw draw in those interviewers. Um, but if you're not into that tech, you're just going, what are you talking about? Why, why is this relevant? And it, and it, from a little bit of, of research, it's not really that relevant, but Greg, tell, tell me how, how well, relevant same is thing, it? same thing. Is it for elk or is it for Bigfoot? Don't know. But you know, I mean, it, look, if I were that afraid of Bigfoot that I didn't think a 270 would take him out, I might not go back in the woods. I might <laughs> right. stay. I, and as much as he's seeing Bigfoot at the mall and everywhere else, I might move to a new state. But who knows? I think when people see Bigfoot, they see Bigfoot. I think it's just the way it is. The guy on the left does a pride and ego up, starts talking to him about giving him the chance to run right back into more wood lore. And he goes right in it. And then Mark, I think, is just ancillary to the story. The, the firearm is just ancillary. It puts him back in the woods, gives him more things to talk about, gives him more credibility. And the guy on the, on the right side is just in data intake <clears throat> sitting there. He's still enamored. Chase, what do you got? Uh, the I'll just say this, uh, from zero behavior perspective at all, a 300 Magnum will not go through a tree that big, period, <laughs> unless the tree is dead. The U.S. Navy, uh, which I served in for 20 years, has a sniper rifle called the Mark 13, which I'm very familiar with. It will not go through a tree. It won't go through a tree that big. Well, how about that big? Not going to happen. So uh, I'll just call that one on that, Scott. All right, this is what I call He-Man talk, because when guys get together and start talking about guns and protection and what they do if this happened and I do this if that happened, they love to say what happened during that. And these these guys sitting on the on the couch are like two little boys watching somebody tell them a story, and I know what that looks like because there was when I was little we lived in, in a town called Louisa, Kentucky, and the guy that cut cut my brothers and my my hair was a guy named Ronnie Lakin. And one time he told this story about the time he took his own tonsils out and it was aimed at us because we were sitting there listening to him. And I'm sure everybody was, when I think back about it, I know that's why he, why he did it. Cause I went home, my dad was a doctor and I told him the story about how, how Ronnie took his own tonsils out and we bought it. And these guys are buying it. They're, they're in as hard as they can. Maybe that one that's closest to us isn't in as deep. But that one on the other side with the beard, man, he's all in. He believes Ronnie Lincoln took his own tonsils out. So that's what I see. Do you think anybody's still watching? Oh, yeah. I hope oh, so. yeah. I think so, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. If, oh, if yeah. Watching, are, hang comment. on. It gets better. <laughs> yeah, if you're watching, comment and hit the like button. <laughs> I know how it feels to walk with a rifle and have that feed you back and kind of bolster you up, make you stand tall. 
and if you're very skilled with that rifle, you should stand tall. Yeah. How do you feel now about having a rifle, and not just because of your own experience, but your knowledge of Bigfoot, these creatures, and what does that rifle speak to you now in terms of what confidence that you should hold on? I'll give you a good example. Yes. When I was hunting that day, I had a 270. Correct. One of the finest deer rifles around. Uh, shoots a 130 grain bullet, which is not a big bullet, but it's a good flat shooting bullet. Kill mm -hmm. a lot of deer with it. Uh, he, uh, that creature made me uh, feel like I had a BB gun. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm getting ready, uh, hopefully near, I'm going to go elk hunting, start elk hunting. And I found his rifle uh, down at a dealership in Houston, Texas, where they have rifles from boy back when you were a kid. kid. And they had the gun was brand new. And so I bought a 300 Magnum. I said, this time when I go, you know, yeah. it ain't gonna be no little 270s and 30 out sixes. I got a 300 bag to BAR. Right. Right. Something that's, you know, shooting some pretty good lead if I have to. Because, you know, that's what I happened that day. I had a seven millimeter Magnum and, and it'd make that 270 look like a BB gun. Right. right. Categorical I mean, difference. Just, I mean, uh, you know, I set targets up. A friend one day we were shooting, and we were shooting at a hundred yards, and he shot my 270 at a, a, a tree, shooting a target, and I hear the bullet, you know, but when he shot that seven mag, it was just and then pow, yeah, that bullet hit, and it went out the back of a tree. The tree was that big around. He went, and I, that impressed the heck out of me. Right. And, and and it's always come down to it, you know, what would I have done if I'd had that seven mag that day? Mm -hmm. I don't know if he could have intimidated me as bad, you know. And so that's why I bought this big caliber rifle, this 300 Magnum. And that's what you have now. Yeah, so when I do the way I'm hunting, mm -hmm. I'll be toting that. Mike, have you measured or have you been able to keep track of, I don't know, the frequency or the volume of reports that you've heard? Have they been increasing over the years or well, is it steadily, just a response? They're steadily to increasing. Steadily increasing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Why do you think that is? I think the population is growing, number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think the, uh, and you know, when a creature, you know, when he's born and he gets a certain age, uh, the, old, the old dude in, in the group, he's going to kick him out. Correct. Right. And then, you know, especially if, you know, if he looks at one of the old dude's girls, yeah. you know, you're automatically out. And I think that's where a lot of the trouble comes, uh, happens. Uh, the one that uh, that I got into it with, he was he was built like a bodybuilder. He had no fat on him. He, I mean, he was bowed up. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think when the old old dude kicks them out, they're mad. And I think that's how sometimes you get a rogue male. You know, he's 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 on the tear. He's mad, and he's looking for another clan to get in. And the only way he's going to get that clan, he's going to take that old man out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's mad. Okay. Uh, and uh, I think that's where a lot of the trouble, the, the zero serious encounters happen when you run in, to, uh, you know, a cat like that, you know. <laughs> yeah. Wow. This is awesome. <laughs> All right, Greg, what do you got? So now by this point, if you've watched the behavior panel for going on three years, you know why I wanted to do Bigfoot, because I was pretty sure this is what we would end up with. And there's a whole lot of stuff here. This guy's a great storyteller. Look at the guy on the left. He's clearly now aware of the camera and he's paying real close attention to it. Our storyteller has slowed down. He's speaking very slowly and he's pontificating at every turn. He gives him a chance. He's now getting into all kinds of stuff about he's I, I say now he's Jane Goodall of the Bigfoot because he's figured out all their culture, how all their stuff works, what their mating rituals or some of them are bowed up and bodybuilding. But when he talks about the one being mad, he adapts by rubbing his hands on his feet and legs. Look guys, this is, we're getting close to just about done here. I think with any credibility that he brought in the beginning, this is a great example of why you have to be careful what you watch and how edited it is. Scott, what do you got? All right. Again, he he starts talking about Bigfoot as a creature. He, I don't think we've heard him say Bigfoot, have we? Have we heard him say Bigfoot? He always calls it the creature or these creatures. 
I don't know if some he separates himself so from it. So we'll say, man, you're talking about Bigfoot. <laughs> yeah, I don't. No, they get offended know. when you call them Bigfoot. That's the, oh, they do. Really? Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, because and that's why they're <laughs> that's what makes it more okay. I got. I don't. I know. But through, throughout all this stuff, where he knows about what they do, he knows they're they're he's got the hierarchy figured out. He knows they're in a, they're in packs or groups. He, he knows how the how the the main how the alpha of the Bigfoot pack kicks out the one who's like looking at the other the girls, big the girl Bigfoots, all that stuff. But you know what? Hadn't taken any pictures of them. Didn't set up any cameras of them. Not once. No pictures does he show. <laughs> we'll get to that in just a minute, though. So over the years, he's told this story, like I said earlier, so many times. He's added so many little things to this. He's He has, not only is he the, the, he's the Bigfoot master. He's like the master of the Bigfoot world. This is the guy. This is the main guy. Who's the UFO guy you were talking about, Greg? What's his name? Lazar. He's the Bob Lazar of the Bigfoots. So he he knows everything about him. He knows he knows he knows in depth all the secrets, the way they act, the way they're raised, all these things, and it, it's all coming from what he's heard about big uh, heard about Bigfoot packs. Things he's heard about wolf packs and deers, how they live and what happens with them, and gorillas. He's heard about I'm sure growing up in school and squirrels and all these how they all act in nature, and he's just put that on them is what he's done, along with layering over the anthropomorphic side of it where they're they're almost human. Chase, what do you got? You want me to be an advocate? I'm going to be an advocate. Yeah, yeah. do it, man. Go yeah, sure. He needs, go. Mr. Willie needs some support. I'm losing. Yeah. I'm losing so much ground, and I'm going to wait till the very end to say whether or not, or what my verdict is. I'm going to wait till the end. <laughs> I can't wait. So right here we have good body narration. There's a few gaps. Uh, there is a consistent blink rate throughout the entire video. So the whole video, consistent blink rate. This video, as opposed to the other one, there's abdominal breathing. Abdominal, when he's usually a chest breather, abdominal is suggestive of more relaxation. But as a quick devil's advocate, when you have two people like that sitting in front of you, it can make you relax and become a little bit silly. Let's just say that. But the only stress here is a small bit of fidgeting and some foot movement that we're a little familiar with around his theory about these rogue males. But I would I would say uh, to to all you three, this isn't deception because it's a theory. So there's not much here in terms of potential deception at all because he's discussing a theory. So take that, Mark. What do you I got? will take that and I will run with that because he is discussing the shoddy theory of alpha male behavior, which came from monitoring wolves in captivity. And then the results of monitoring wolves in captivity being positioned over the top of human society. So we get this idea that there is always like one alpha male. No, not in wolf packs at all, at all. In fact, they'll swap out who's leading between males and females, depending on what job needs doing, just like human society. In fact, just like any social mammal society, you don't have one entity in charge all the time. They take turns depending on what the job is. And we now know that in his, you know, Bigfoot Smurf land, people have different jobs. And so that's just like our land, which means your bo your CEO boss, yeah, when they go to their club, isn't the leader of the club. They're, they they because they don't want to be. It's like I'm in charge of that. I don't want to be in charge of this. They're not alpha all the time. So, so all he's done. So I know it's bunk because if he'd really watched a social mammal group, he wouldn't be seeing any of the stuff that he's talking about. He wouldn't be seeing one male that chucks out all the other uh, young males vying for the, any social mammal group will be as big as 800, which means as the, if you were the male in charge, you can't afford to just throw out every male. Like you can't know, you can't reproduce at that level. Also, you'll just get such inbreeding, everything will die. So look, it's utter, utter bunk, and and he hasn't. He's just watched too many bad shows with this idea of the of the you know society of the alpha, which is 
utter, utter nonsense and, and totally inaccurate. So there we go. Was that you, the kind of response you were looking for, Chase? You and your stupid education. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, the other thing is we know that they can tear men in half, so they could at least tear another Bigfoot's arm off, I'm sure. Totally. Why send them out? Just, yeah, rip them up. Yeah. <laughs> and That's then baby. We haven't seen, we haven't heard him talk about fighting, have we? No, no. Oh, I'm putting a wrestling ring in mine. I'm going uh, <laughs> BMA, Bigfoot. Mike, have you measured or have you been able to keep track of, I don't know, the frequency or the volume of reports that you've heard? Have they been increasing over the years or well, is it steadily, just a response? They're steadily to, increasing. Steadily increasing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Why do you think that is? I think the population is growing, number one. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think the, uh, and you know, when a creature, you know, when he's born and he gets a certain age, uh, the, old, the old dude in, in the group, he's going to kick him out. Correct. Right. And then, you know, especially if, you know, if he looks at one of the old dude's girls, mm -hmm. you know, you're automatically out. And I think that's where a lot of the trouble comes uh, happens uh, the one that uh, that I got into it with he was he was built like a bodybuilder he had no fat on him he, I mean he was bowed up mm -hmm. and uh, I think when the old old dude kicks them out they're mad and I think that's how sometimes you get a rogue male you know he's 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 on the tear he's mad and he's looking for another clan to get in and the only way he's gonna get that clan he, he's gonna take that old man out mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's mad, okay, uh, and uh, I think that's where a lot of the trouble, uh, the, the real serious encounters happen when you run into, uh, you know, a cat like that, you know. Matter of fact, uh, uh, from my house one morning, we were going to the doctor about 10 years ago, and uh, we were about uh, north of Keechai, about two miles, and there, there was this property, it's, it's open, a big open piece of land on the left. And uh, I saw some crows, I looked over my left and I saw some crows about uh, 70, 80 feet from the fence line. And you had some facing each other like that, northeast, and you had some facing like that, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, one of them, the crow that's on the east side, he turns and starts walking real brisk, aggressive uh, towards the east. And I'm like, what the heck? Well, there was a big uh, female standing there on the edge of the woods, mm -hmm. and she was real nasty. I mean, her hair, mud, I'll tell them why. I said, look, look. And she said, yeah. So we went in. Uh, she told my doctor, she said, man, I saw a big one today. So mm -hmm. your wife saw it. She saw it. She well, saw it. we were coming back through there, it was two weeks ago. She said, look, there she is again. Right. Two weeks ago? Yeah. From now? Now. So she saw it again? Yeah. And this land, uh, mm -hmm. these people uh, own it. It's a lot of land, and they're very wealthy people. You know, had a big yacht that sell around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to this lady. She wrote books, and uh, she said, "You know, I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot, you know, and stuff like that." She said, "I, I hear panthers hollering at night and everything." I said, "Ma'am, I said they can sound just like a panther crying." Right. I'm taking y'all down. I'm I'm exposing the truth. Bring it on, man. Let's do this. <laughs> <laughs> Exposing the truth. We haven't had this much fun, yeah. as, we have had this much fun <laughs> since Mark showed up with a colander on his head. You yeah, yeah. This is, this is oh, the yeah. rub. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I saw that coming. I saw you off at the pass there. That, that was, was funny. Good. That was good. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we go. All right, Mark, what do you got? Uh, look. Uh, the, the interviewers are getting restless at this point. Uh, certainly the one that is that is uh, nearest to us, who is not so pro, uh, at this point he is now not comfortable. There's a real suspension in him. He's, at times he's, he's holding his, his, his breath. He's gone for, for, for stillness. Then there's self-soothing there, which is repetitive uh, action and adaptions, moving of things around um, in, in order to make the world more comfortable. Uh, he is he is not as comfortable with this is uh, this idea as Mr. Chase Hughes, who will who will be showing us uh, his comfort with the situation. Chase, why is this why is this a possibility? I will continue advocating for this. <laughs> so, 
the only thing in this clip <laughs> is the thing about the Panther call. And something about him saying this might have made him a little bit uncomfortable, but maybe he's just uncomfortable making noises around people. It could be. It okay, could Chase, be. you just got you, you just got to cut it out. <laughs> Man, I'm gonna it. go all deep on this, dude. <laughs> Wow. I'm going to go all the way. <laughs> Do it. Lean in, man. Do it. It could be that he was uncomfortable saying this at the time to this woman that he's talking about, or that maybe he doubts himself a little bit. Maybe it doesn't sound exactly like a panther goal. Either way, there's not, there's not a cluster of behavior here, gentlemen. There's no cluster. Keep in mind that we're, we're not in control of the questions that the interviewers are asking here. So, you know, maybe some crappy questions. So we can only observe these reactions to these two guys who wholeheartedly believe him, which lends uh, social comfort to the situation. And if he wasn't sure that these two men believed him, we might be seeing some different behavior. But uh, I don't see much. Mr. Hartley. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I see a whole lot. So let's start with the guy on the left. His BS meter is pegged. He's like, oh, see that foot popping up every time when he starts his next story about seeing Martha the Bigfoot. His foot pops up like, oh, here we have another one. Here's a really good thing for you. We look for word pattern shifts. And when something changes, we always say, hmm, why'd they say that? When matter of fact rolls out of somebody who you are suspicious of, you should be really suspicious. Matter of fact, everything up to now was not a fact, but matter of fact, it was this. Then he goes into the foot stamping thing that we saw earlier, which was a good indicator of deception. And then, and then he gives more details about the crows than he does about the creature. When he describes the creature, he just says she's covered in mud. Well, hold on. Wait, how long was her fur? What else? Tell me more about her. I want to know more about her than I do the crows that you just talked about, because that's really easy. Uh, then he saw that same Bigfoot two weeks ago in the same place he saw it 10 years ago. Well, damn, they're pretty boring creatures. They're just hanging out on the side of the road looking at crows, I guess. I don't. There's just a logic thing here that makes you want to just jump in there and go, wait a minute. Why do you think that Bigfoot's hanging out there? You know all about them. Why would female Bigfoots hang out on the side of the road? And now they sound like panthers. <laughs> you know what? If, you've ever, if you ever want to see a really good example of this, there's a guy named Henry Lewis who claims to have killed, you know, I don't know how many at this point, hundreds. And he is, they're giving him cigarettes and Coke and that kind of stuff to drink when they're talking to him and he's in prison for his life. And he's telling them a story and he says, did you ever kill anybody in Japan? And they go, yeah. He goes, yeah, of course I kill people in Japan. And they say, how'd you get there? And he said, I drove, of course. This is a guy who's just filling in the blanks for the people he's telling the story to. It's just, Scott, what do you got? All right. Like you said, he opens up with, as a matter of fact, he hadn't said that yet. He hadn't said that yet. And then, like you said, his feet are pushing down on the floor. And But here's we, we're starting to see a change. He's getting real animated here. He's getting a bit louder. He says about 10 years ago. He doesn't go into the specific dates like he's done before. He doesn't say what year it is. Before, he was down to the month, and we knew how cold it was outside. We knew what the weather was. All those, he doesn't, he, we're not at that point. We're not there. So he's, something's up here. And keep in mind, while he's driving to the doctor, he sees all this stuff and starts making decisions, these logical decisions about what's happened as he's driving down the road. You know, let's say he's going 45 miles an hour and it's, it's a little two lane road. Okay. Doesn't sound very fast, but as he's driving by this, he sees a big foot. <laughs> he sees a big foot. He notices the crows are acting weird. Crows are acting weird. He's paying attention to birds, too, as he's driving around, which means he's got to be doing that the whole time, looking for birds and Bigfoots and crows and you know, whatever he's doing. And so he notices all this odd behavior, what he would terms odd behavior, in the crows. And just a few seconds, snaps, goes right by him. Then his illustrators start getting big again. He starts getting in there. And he's, he starts, he gets animated and starts voicing and starts telling these things that animals do and, and how they would act and what is normal for that. And that little bearded one back there in the back, that little fat one, man, he's just eating it all up. He can't hardly stand it. He's so into it. Whereas the other one's just going, oh, I got to get out of here, man. This is this is a little <laughs> bit too much, you know. He's thinking about what his wife's going to think when this thing comes out. And he's thinking, how many people are going to see this, I wonder? Not very many. I don't know, who's going to pay attention to that? Greg Hartley? Well, more now. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, 
he just gets, starts getting, it, it, then he starts um, getting more detailed. And the, and the, that one, the, the one closest to us, I think, I think he's getting a little bit more skeptical and, and his, his skepticism is showing a little bit more as we go along here. So that's all I got. Matter of fact, uh, uh, from my house one morning, we were going to the doctor about 10 years ago. And uh, we were about uh, north of Keecha, about two miles. And there, there was this property, it's, it's open, a big open piece of land on the left. And uh, I saw some crows, I looked over my left and I saw some crows about uh, mm -hmm. 70, 80 feet from the fence line. And you had some facing each other like that, northeast, and you had some facing like that, you know. And, and so all of a sudden, one of them, the crow that's on the east side, he turns and starts walking real brisk, aggressive uh, towards the east. And I'm like, what the heck? Well, there was a big uh, female standing there on the edge of the woods, mm -hmm. and she was real nasty. I mean, her hair, mud, I'll tell them why. I said, look, look. And she said, yeah. So we went in, and she told my daughter, she said, man, I saw a big one today. So and your wife saw it? She saw it. She well, saw we it. were coming back through there, it wasn't two weeks ago. She said, look, there she is again. Right. Two weeks ago? Yeah. From now? Now. So she saw it again? Yeah. And this land uh, mm -hmm. that these people uh, own it, it's a lot of land, and they're very wealthy people. They you know, had a big yacht that sell around the world. Mm -hmm. And so I was talking to this lady. She wrote books. And uh, she said, you know, I don't know if I believe in Bigfoot, you know, and stuff like that. And she said, I... I hear panthers hollering at night and everything. I said, ma'am, I said, they can sound just like a panther crying. I'm going to keep going. You should. All right. This is it. This is our last one, guys. All right. And recorded it for more than just a blank. Sure. Right? But a nice, solid stretch of Yeah. Something you imagine. Something you, you as believers, you you can't help but think of possibly seeing one day whether it's somebody else's footage or not even if you had that they won't believe it i still th we still think it, it ain't worth the crap it ain't worth the crap i don't care i've seen good footage right i've got i've got footage you do in my phone you know and and people say you know uh she's true real. And, and some of them are hidden trees. And since I know how to look for it, I can look. And I can show it to you until you show me that squatch. Mm -hmm. And you say, I can't tell you. Well, when I start taking, she'll point it out to you, show you this and this. And you say, yeah, I see, you know, I see it. Yeah. You know? You have to be taught. We have to be taught. And that's where a lot of people say, there ain't none in the woods. I've been hunting all my, I've got friends that say, man, I've hunted all my life. I ain't never seen one. Right. Yeah, because you've never seen one. You know, I have uh, come up on them uh, back when I was squirrel hunting. Uh, I would hunt down in the creeks and the branches, the little branches, and you know, they were down 20, 30 foot down low, and the water would be down there, and squirrels would come down there, you know, and uh, uh, I'd pop them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, and before this happened, uh, my encounter happened, must have been two or three years, uh, I've come up on some big tracks in the sand, and uh, um, I got to follow it, and uh, the next thing I know, the tracks were gone. You know, so so they went, and, they and then they just gone. Well, and I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good tracker. And I, you know, hunter and on, and I knew I said he's here. You know, whoever made those tracks is here, and so uh, I got to looking around, and I seen some muddy water coming down my way. And I said, yeah, that's it. I know what you did. Mm -hmm. you got down the creek, trying sure. to, you know, trying to walk the creek. Which is an old trick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's an old Indian trick, you know. Right. I mean? And uh, so I got on up about another 150 yards, and there was a round curve. You know, I, I got a real bad smell, you know. And so someone just told me I just caught it off, and went the other way. But uh, yeah, um, you know, just stuff like that, you know. Fascinating. Uh, Mark, what do you got? Well, there's only one thing to look at here, in my view, which is, he says, uh, yeah, I got photographs of these things on my phone. <laughs> there's a pregnant pause between the two. And at no point does anybody go, get out your phone, man. Let's have a look. Let's go through. 
Let's have a look at those photos. Nothing. Wouldn't you? You would just go. You and I would just go hand over your phone and let's take a look. Nothing. Nothing. They don't call him out at all. It is just bizarre. B- big tracks. There's the, the illustrators are out of sync. Um, you know, this this is essentially what deception looks like, and and especially when you don't get called out on it. Next time anybody says to you, "I have pictures of Bigfoot on my phone," or UFOs, or aliens, or any elves, anything, ghosts, anything, go brilliant. Can I have a look? Do that, please, Greg. What do you got? Yeah, or, or at least, how about you text those over to me? Whatever. I want to know right. any kind of evidence like that. If you got short of a drawing, okay, that I might not be interested in. But the guy on the right by now is using the right language. He is saying believers, believers. Okay, it takes belief. I don't have it. Chase, you may still be trying to hold on to a shred of it for comedy's sake, but <laughs> none of us believe it. The guy on the left is now full-blown adapting. If you watch him, he's doing it touching himself he's trying to figure out where to go next and and i think scott you're right he's thinking people are going to see me on this show and they're going to wonder what the hell i'm thinking most people when they're storytelling try to outdo themselves try to outdo other people's stories not mike mike outdoes himself well hell i got video of it i got pictures of him it's just where do you go from here and i when the guy drops his hands i think he's going to say hold on you got pictures he doesn't there's also a couple of other things. You can see that Mr. Willie puts his hand in his crotch when he's telling them that story, and his toes point in. We typically associate toes pointing in with insecurity, and then he sets the stage for the squirrel hunt stuff. It just look, I, I'm just done. He's out of BS steam, and I'm out, I'm out of it too. Uh, Chase, why don't you defend him for us? Greg, this has all the hallmarks of. A truthful story here and <laughs> that he it believes happened until you know maybe a point in this clip or something but you know when he gets to the end of the tracking story there's something maybe a little bit off when he tells them that he stopped and went the other way but uh there's a little bit of hesitancy at the end i think it's just because he's just mustering up the courage to to continue the story <laughs> and these filler words that are increasing at the end I think this is just a desire to shift the topic of discussion because he's bored with telling this because it's so truthful. <laughs> you look like you're telling the Bigfoot story. <laughs> well, actually, I have a sketch uh, here right beside me. Uh, not a photograph or anything, but it's just uh, from the from my experience. <laughs> yeah. What's her Sorry, name? Sorry, guys. It's just. Uh, <laughs> What's her name? Keep Wait going. a minute. I got to go now. I want to. Oh, I'm sorry. All right. Oh, no, no, no. Hang on a second. Uh, See, now the interviewer is using words that involve, like you were saying, Greg, that involve religion and faith. Faith. He calls these people believers. That's where it starts getting you. You start gathering up. This is where you start. I start a cult. So he says he has big uh, footage of Bigfoot. But we see this is great because we're seeing in real time, we're seeing him deconflict this stuff and come up with the with answers protecting that and defending his his answer they just gave. It's unbelievable. It's real it's it's just it's fantastic because we're seeing these things that we're seeing the liar's loop happen in real time through the most important parts of it. And he says he's got Bigfoot pictures in his pocket. Boy, we've been waiting for that. Never before has he said, you know, I got pictures of that. If he did, obviously like we said, obviously, like we said before. You just say, shoot, yeah, man, what's up? But he defends that by saying, you wouldn't recognize him if I showed him to you. You you have to know what to look for. You know, that's why I could step out back and take a picture of the woods and start pointing stuff. And you can't see him because now they become damn master disguise that, you know, this is and what a movie this is going to make. So not only has he not taken, he's, he has taken pictures of him, but you can't see him because they're masters of disguise. You have to know what to look for. To be able to to be able to see him and uh we also find out bigfoots use old indian tricks to hide uh, to hide their tracks when they start going back up the the creek or the river or whatever going back up the water so they're they, they, apparently they're brilliant and they're connected to the indians now um another thing when he starts talking about how something stinks as he starts tracking it what stinks is a story 
That's what stinks. That's why he has to stop because he's got nothing else at that point. What else can he say? I followed it to the to, to Scott Rouse's Bigfoot reality. No, like there's a big hat. No, he can't do that. He's done. He's done at that point. And recorded it for more than just a blank. Sure. Right. But a nice solid stretch of yeah. Time. Something you imagine, something you, you, as believers, you you can't help but think of possibly seeing one day, whether it's somebody else's footage or not. Even if you had that, they won't believe it. I still, th we still think it, it ain't worth the crap. It ain't worth the crap. I don't care. I've seen good footage, but right. I've got I've got footage. You do in my phone. You know, and and people say, you know, uh, it's just true. And and some of them are hidden trees. And since I know how to look for it, I can look and I can show it to you until you show me that squatch. Mm -hmm. And you say, you I can't tell you. Well, when I start taking, she'll point it out to you, show you this and this, and you say, yeah, I see, you know, I see it. Yeah, you know, you have to be taught. We have to be taught, and that's where a lot of people say there ain't none in the woods. I've been hunting them. I've got friends that man, I've hunted all my life. I ain't never seen one. Right. Yeah, because you've never seen one. You know, I have uh, come up on them uh, back when I was squirrel hunting. Uh, I would hunt down in the creeks and the branches, the little branches, and you know, they were down 20, 30 foot down low, and the water would be down there, and squirrels would come down there, you know, and uh, uh, I'd pop them, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, one day, and before this happened, uh, my encounter happened, must have been two or three years. Uh, I've come up on some big tracks in the sand. And uh, uh, I got to follow it. And uh, the next thing I know, the tracks were gone. You know. So, so they went and, they and then they just gone. Well, and I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty good tracker, you know, 100 and on. And I knew, I said, he's here, you know, whoever made those tracks is here. And so uh, I got to looking around and I seen some muddy water coming down my way. I said, yeah, that's it. I know what you did. Mm -hmm. Got down the creek. Trying sure. to, you know, trying to walk a creek. Which is an old trick. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's an old Indian trick, you know right. what I mean? And uh, so I got on up about another 150 yards and there was a round curve. You know, I, I got a real bad smell. You know, and so someone just told me I just called it off, went the other way. But uh, yeah, um, you know, just stuff like that. You know, fascinating. Let's throw it around the room and talk about what we think we've seen. Mark, what do you got? Let's keep it thirty seconds less because my earphone batteries are going out. My headset. I stuff. know too. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I'm really open to the idea. I, you know, uh, there's a possibility uh, that there are creatures out there that we have not encountered yet. This story is not an example of that, in my strong opinion. Chase, where you go? <laughs> We're, none of us are saying that Bigfoot doesn't exist. So, even if we I all find... am. <laughs> all right, I get 12 more seconds of my 30. Okay, sorry. You did that. Us telling you he's not lying or lying is different than us telling you he believes or doesn't believe large portions of what he saw. And I think he believes... One of the encounters, the larger encounter that he initially described, I think he experienced something similar to that, and it might have collected dust uh, through the years in reality. Um, but I'm I'm not so sure about the rest of it. Uh, Bigfoot may exist. We're not telling you it doesn't, but, well, this guy is, uh, that guy. <laughs> but Greg, what do you think? Yeah. So guys, first and foremost, this is a Maslow's hierarchy story, period. I mean, the rest of it, it, he could have seen a monkey in a tutu and it would have become the same thing. What has happened is he's wedged himself into the lore of Bigfoot and now he has to have more and more esteem. That's just human nature. We all do it. And I always say, it's just that once you're there, you got to know more about Bigfoot than the other guy and the community starts looking up to you and you can see these guys did and they come to talk to him and it just escalates and escalates and escalates. 
Do I think there's such thing as a Bigfoot? I'd like to believe. I'm not sure I do. I've been in the woods a lot. Never seen one. Maybe I just am not a Bigfoot seer. Scott. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I think he's full of it. I don't think he. I, I don't think he saw Bigfoot, Big Feet. I don't think his wife did either. I don't think it's true. And I know, and, and there's a lot of people out there, people out there that believe in him. And don't get after me in the comments. Send me some pictures. I want to see the pictures and video. I don't want to see the good stuff because you got a good phone now. iPhones come out with some really good cameras on those phones. So I want to see a picture. Don't come at me and say, you don't know this. You don't know that. Send me a picture. That's all I'm saying. You don't have to say anything. Say, what about this? What's up? And send me that. That's what I want. And then I'll, and if I see it, like I said before, I'll start hiring them and I'll build them a house and put cameras in the whole thing. And we'll both make a fortune. So just let me know. All right, fellas, I think this is another good one. And uh, we'll see you next time. So what do you got?